you know, HMR here. And I'm um, just, oh, I've always just misplaced something when I start a live stream for some reason. So, yeah, the relational impossibility of BPD untreated relationships with people with BPD untreated. <clears throat> and just before I start to talk about that a little bit more, one thing I did want to say is that this isn't necessarily the case for every single person in the world with BPD because they're not all the same. And I would know, I hope this is working. I'm on a different computer, so I really don't know. But they're not all the same <clears throat> because there are people who are getting treatment. There are people who have healed and recovered. There are people that are significantly treated and moving forward. So when I work with clients, you know, there can be a myriad of different variations according to where people are at, you know, with BP, et cetera. So, good. Now I finally figured out it's really working. That's important to know. <laughs> anyway, um, I just, just a couple other things. So, not all people with BP are the same. People tend to really want to vilify them after they've been hurt. You get into these relationships because you don't, you don't know. You can't know what's about to happen if it's the first time for sure. And people have codependency and this predisposes how you get involved in these relationships. But it doesn't mean you know why or you could possibly understand what, you know, what's going to happen. So there's that. And then there's also um, borderline personality disorder is a much wider within its own category it's, it's like, I wonder about all the information out there, you know, like that they're flipping into NPD if they do this. And that they have to be, I'm not talking about the really severe stuff. I'm talking about the common, which is really horrible stuff that people with BPD do to other people, untreated people with BPD do to other people in relationships. Because, like, there's all these patterns and all these reasons, but... That doesn't really matter when you're getting really hurt. But I think what I was just going to say is there's this wide category of what BPD really is and means, you know. <clears throat> so I've been trying to speak to this a little bit lately. Like there is, there, there are, sorry, narcissistic defenses in BPD. There can be levels of grandiosity in some with BPD, which is not going to be as extreme as somebody with NPD. But... Let me, let me think what else is there. Um, they can really, their empathy, they can have the capacity for empathy. But then when they're triggered to emotional dysregulation, no, it's really super compromised to not there in those moments. But with, it, with a deeper and broader understanding of what BPD really does encompass in different iterations, in different people, you know, and those untreated, it, it doesn't flip into NPD so easily. Like, there's comorbidity, for sure, with some people, with BPD and NPD. And just like there's other things going on. But I think people really need to think about... Oh, yes, thank you. You said it's working, Jonathan. Yes, I finally figured that out. It's just because I'm on another computer and I just wasn't sure of all the settings and everything. Um, my last computer, not that it's important, but the one that I had said a few, many live streams ago was hit the floor a few times too many and was falling apart, the casing, etc. Well, last night it hit the floor one last time and um, I was able to get everything off it, but it was pink and all distorted visually. It's it's toast now. Anyhow, this is a better computer anyway. Um, so what was I going to say? Um, yeah, the relational impossibility. Nobody knows this when you get involved with somebody with BPD. And, and it's the untreated people with BPD who, A, aren't going to manifest it all the same. B, aren't going to be all the same. Because, yeah, there's some more. I don't think there's anything called BPD light. But there's definitely more severity. You know, like, there is BPD, which is pretty bad and, and pretty difficult for people to relate. And they don't know how to love and all that. And then there's this more, you know, you get into a little more severity. And they can be way more abusive, etc. And then the absolute severity, which may well be psychopathy. Who knows? But 
the thing is, people with codependency, once you sort of, you know, you've been idealized and you have those unmet needs from childhood, some unmet needs from childhood, not the same for everybody with codependency, then what happens is <clears throat> once you get into this vortex, as I know I don't have to tell so many people, it feels next to impossible to get out of it. But these are impossible relationships. And largely because of the woundedness and the damage that people with BPD have, which I'm not making any excuses for the way they behave and treat people. And the other thing is also because of people's uh, with codependency, their own woundedness. But, you know, that's not to say you're responsible for what the person with BPD does at all, because you're not. Um... Yeah, well, that's the thing, Ian, like what you're saying, your girlfriend who you're in the process of breaking up with. A um, person with BPD can be okay for weeks. Again, a different manifestation of a pattern. They could be okay for weeks until the next trigger, dysregulated, emotional, whatever, an episode. Or maybe it's two days. Or for some people, it's going to be, they're going to switch, fluctuate moods, uh, split into value, maybe come back to idealization or base something in, in you know that isn't idealization but isn't evaluation uh, multiple times a day sometimes that's going to happen for people um once a week sometimes it's once a month and then when they start getting into treatment it can it can change too but there are these various different patterns within BPD so they're not all going to be the same <clears throat> Well, and then you said, but then one day she'll suddenly be like angry, manic. Well, oh, maniac. Okay. Um, <laughs> extremely unreasonably demanding. Just looking for a verbal or physical fight. It's like a switch has been turned on. Well, it's not a switch turned on. It's a, it's, it's a trauma response of defense because there's a trigger. And the key thing to know is people with BP that get triggered aren't being triggered by you. It's happening internally, but they think it's you because they don't know if they've had no treatment. So, yeah, unfortunately, there's all that, too. Um, and you said, uh, yeah, it is still BPD. You said, is this still BPD? Yes, it is still BPD. And, um, well, like manic, manic doesn't apply to borderline personality. That's what people with bipolar get. So, but misunderstanding and completely unreasonable, yeah, that's a trigger dissociated, um, you know, it triggered into emotional dysregulation, untreated person with BPD. Um, yeah, it can be mixed with flashes of normalcy. They can be all over the map, and it's definitely still BPD. But, you know... When you get into a relationship with a borderline and you don't know it first, or even like lots of people say, or clients of mine have said, well, he or she told me in the beginning they had BPD, but people don't know what it is, right? So with no reference point for what it could be or what it means or why it's a relational impossibility when they're untreated, you know, it's it's very difficult, but it gets very confusing and and then, of course, you fall in love with the person that you think they are in the idealizing and mirroring and their codependent people-pleasing phase. And the reality is that's not who they are, but that's what's so difficult for people to let go of. And like what you're describing here, Ian, is you have to realize that even though for a few weeks maybe she can be really okay and who, and, and probably that means she has, you know, these people can have good qualities, etc. But, you know, on balance, getting in a relationship with someone with BPD, which you don't know in the beginning, is like stepping on a roller coaster. And it's just going to be this up and down and all over the place, confusing, discombobulating kind of experience because, you know, they really, untreated, they really don't know what's going on with them. So it's not all even something... I've had clients who've said over the years and recently, well, I finally figured out I shouldn't take it personally because it's not really about me. But, of course, you're, you're experiencing it personally, right? 
So it makes it very difficult. And Jonathan, I hear you on um, the BPD light. Um, yeah, because a lot of people think quiet BPD or what is that called? Discouraged borderline is like BPD light. No, it's not. They just internalize so much. You don't see as much like coming at you, but you might like from time to time. And he said, with my now ex of a few years ago, uh, sorry, days ago. Wow. Sorry, that's that's so new. Um, we ended things mutually and out of love. Well, and she entered into treatment. That's positive. She was completely capable of empathy. Well, and, and you're make there, Jonathan. I'm, I'm glad that that was your experience, although still probably somewhat painful, because you're making my point exactly. You see, they're not all the same. Some will do things mutually, just like you're, you're describing. And well, she entered treatment. That's positive for her. And she was completely capable of empathy. So there's so many different iterations and presentations within people with BPD untreated that that's why I keep saying they're not all the same. Um, and Jonathan, Jonathan said, what I noticed was the switch that turned on typically coincided with her menstrual cycle. Well, that can be true for a lot of women with BPD, and that can have something to do with making it worse, or perhaps, you know, that because there's more emotionality to women at that point, time of the month, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it would always be that, but, you know, for some women, it might be more attuned to that, because... What's happening in women's bodies at that time of the month is definitely about feeling more, like even if they don't have BPD. And um, <laughs> well, I don't know what that's about Northern Aquatics, but you know, hey, I'm going to get them for all the reasons I get them, and that's fine because actually those people are just giving me importance and power, aren't they? <laughs> that's not me talking, I'm just saying. So, um, Ian, maybe manic is the wrong word. I appreciate your feedback. Well, and I mean, I'm not, uh, I think people describe things as they just, you know, the way it comes to you. And that's understandable. But I think what I'm trying to do on this channel anyways is educate people that manic isn't what a person with BPD is being. But, you know, is it? so words are important, but people are going to describe the way that they experience it because... You know, maybe you just don't know what other way to put it. And Ian said it's been a 4.5 year roller coaster. Um, she refuses therapy, so I need to get off. Well, yeah, and the other thing about that is that even if they'll go to treatment, you know, in, in you know, if you still haven't broken up and they'll go to treatment, it takes years, you know, for them to really be able to work through things to make create change. Uh, for themselves and for that to be seen by like a partner. So this idea of just trying to work so hard to get them to go to therapy, it really doesn't save relationships. It really doesn't change things. And so I'm sorry to hear it's been a four and a half year roller coaster for you. Um, but yeah, it, it sounds like it's definitely time for you to get off. Uh, hey there, Wills. How are you doing? Jonathan, definitely, she would actually be able to describe the emotional flooding shortly after. Well, yes, and, and many can, and many have more awareness, whether it's fleeting or comes and goes, than others. And But the point is, even when they have awareness, they can't stop the way they behave. They can't stop the triggers because they, they don't have that much awareness yet. And Ian, yes, you do get used to their behavior somewhat. But there's still an underlying stress and anxiety inside of me, and I, and I, yeah, you hate that. Well, yeah, because even if you get used to, like, each person who, who you've been, like, I mean, each one of you who've been with somebody with BPD, that person will have their own pattern, and they will have their own manifestation of the behavior. And so it can vary, right? Kind of like on a spectrum, so to speak, within BPD. And even though you get to kind of know that, or it's a little bit predictable with an individual, even though they're predict predictably unpredictable, well, that's the walking on eggshells, right? And it can be very stressful and produce anxiety because you kind of are sensing the next storm coming 
And, you know, that, that's never pleasant. It's, it's not healthy either, all that stress. And um, Ian said, so I went back to um, own country, moved back and said I will um, live alone and meet at weekends, but it's not the answer. I always feel so weak. Well, yeah, you might benefit from some therapy because if there's codependency there, which is likely, you know, I mean, most people are codependent, that, and he's, but not everybody, but most. And, um, yeah, if you want to still meet with them on the weekend, see, this is the thing, too, that when these relationships need to end, they need to end, and that means really end, and full no contact, so that you can heal and take care of yourself, and then the hope is that the person with BPD will eventually, if not at the time, you know, they'll decide to get their own treatment, and that's lovely. But then you have to forge forward in your own life one step at a time. How are you doing tonight, Deborah? Uh, Ian, I've noticed she has huge mood changes every time the season changes from hot to cold or vice versa. Well, every spring and autumn. And, and you know, I don't know, I... When I had BPD, I never experienced, you know, like if I was going to get triggered by something, it wasn't going to be a seasonal change or whatever. But that that could have some relation to it. Who knows, you know, or what, or what that would mean for her. Uh, Susie Q, um, pretty sure my boyfriend has BPD. But sometimes when he, when he has been drinking for a few hours, he'll rage at me. Well, it's probably abusing alcohol. And that part sounds like narcissism. Well, no, not at all. I mean, people with BPD are quite capable of raging, too. But I'm obviously no shrink. So you're get yeah, well, you know, and, and, and it's the guessing out there, you know, no, no worries. I'm not trying to ever impugn anyone or judge anyone. But but that's another good example, um, Susie Q, that when he's, first of all, the drinking is going to disinhibit, you know, it's, it's, it's just a bad thing. Um, especially for people with BPD or whatever as well. But when he starts raging, it, it, it's still within BPD. You know, people with BPD do rage, and uh, it, it doesn't have to be narcissism at all. And uh, Jonathan, thanks, AJ. It's rough between the pain. I've watched many of your videos and have done lots of research and have realized that I do have a compulsion to rescue, enable, and fix. Yeah, that would be codependency. And, you know, codependency is, again, people have to, the, the, the high value of getting into therapy, as like when I work with clients, I mean, or whoever you choose to work with, I'm not just trying to say, oh, it's just me. But um, the high value is really being able to look back into the wounded inner child, do that healing work. Because I think, you know, a lot of people talk about that, I'm sure, but some people, you know, this idea is like, oh, I don't want to go back in the past and People think they can just sort of go ahead and get in the next relationship. And really, there is some healing there that people need, not only from the relationship, but often from what might have actually led you into the relationship in the first place. But that part is unconscious. That part is not in your conscious mind. You just, hey, we're attracted to somebody. And, you know, everything seemed great in the beginning. When the reality is that the wounded inner child and people with codependency is, you know, on the unconscious level, extremely going to be um, pulling for that same kind of connection to somebody that's usually, for most with codependency, not all, really reminiscent of one parent or, or something to do with both parents. But, you know, it's different for every person with codependency. Well, I think, I think, yeah, Ian, there, to Jonathan, you said, I think there's a similarity in most partners. Well, this is a the thing. There's a similarity in most people with BPD untreated, many similarities, and some similarities in people that become their partners, and then within that trauma bond and within what becomes then, and I'm not saying people with codependency are the same as borderlines, but it then becomes this uh, dynamic, right? The impossible relational dynamic from hell, essentially, because it's a trauma-bonded situation. 
Oh, that's interesting. And you said, I, I actually stopped walking on eggshells a year ago. It feels liberating. I don't tolerate, but it's still not the answer. Ah, yes. Well, Susie Q, if he's an alcoholic, like, wow. I mean, I had a relationship with a BPD, NPD alcoholic, 2004 to 2006. I can't even explain it. But I just remember it was horrible, and I don't, I don't know why I ever did that because, because I always swore my parents are alcoholic as well as cluster B is, and I always swore I'd never be with one. I, of course, I didn't know that in the beginning, but you know these are all the big red flags that people need to heed because it means it's time to go. Um, hoker, hoker, I made it through the divorce. Well, that's good for you. I'm sure that wasn't easy. Uh, he was more communicative but in in the end by email. It was a hell of a 17-year ride. Oh, sorry to hear that. Um, yes, well, you will be recovering for some time, but the good news about that is, you know, one day at a time, one step at a time, and it will start to, over time, uh, feel better. Um, oh, well, if I played some role in getting you through, then... Um, I'm glad to have been of help. Um, and I just hope that you're taking good care of yourself now. And um, I was just going to make a point, uh, make a point, not really, just, just wanted to remember to say in this live stream that I have um, started, I don't know when I'll do it again, but check my community channel um, tab. Sorry, it's not a channel. Check the community tab on my channel once in a while because... Uh, right now, I put up there tonight because people are always watching videos and asking for more, and that's great. But on things I've already done a lot on, so I'm starting to look at there's things I could do more on, there's things maybe I need to get to. But so what's on my community tab right now is a list of videos I've done on BPD and love, like how it's not love in these relationships. And the other subject was on the quiet borderline, I believe, just so people know. Because often people just find a video or two, or maybe they're watching more. But, like, now that I have almost 550 of them, it's getting harder and harder to uh, for people to find videos. And often I get asked on one video about, could I do something on a topic of, you know, that I've already done, like, 10 or 15 of them. So maybe I'll just keep putting them in categories on the community tab. So you might want to check that out once in a while. And where was I here? Let me see. As I try to find where I was. There we go. Um, oh, yes, Jonathan, yes. I do know that, and believe me, I will be um, getting to you soon. A little bit of wait time with a lot of sessions these days, but I will get to everybody. I do. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you, by the way. Oh, hey, Shadow Moses. How are you tonight? Ian said, one thing I learned, stop uh, psychoanalyzing her. I used to spend hours and hours thinking about how and why and what. It doesn't matter. The question is, do I like it? Yes or no. Exactly. Or is it healthy for you? Yes or no. Is it stressing you out? You know, like, exactly. Well, I hear you, Susie Q, and the answer to that is end it and get yourself out of there. Or kick him out whichever way it needs to go. Uh, Jonathan, you hit the nail on the head, AJ. It was apparent. I've identified it. I was subconsciously trying to fix that situation. Oh, I'll be really interested to hear more about that, Jonathan. And I think that, um, you know, it, it is that way for so many with codependency. And for some people, it's a little bit harder to find where did it really begin. But it's it's really compelling stuff because a lot of people grow up and... And maybe don't realize the parent was cluster B. A lot of people grow up and don't realize they've been parentified. And a lot of, you know, family of origins are, are just dysfunctional in all kinds of different ways. Uh, Deborah, borderlines are experts at pulling at your heartstrings. No, they really aren't. <laughs> 
but um, you have to be so strong to resist them. Well, you know, they're really not. See, that's giving your power away. Why do people keep wanting to have the narrative that they're so good at pulling your heartstrings and you have nothing to do with letting them do that? I mean, in the beginning, you don't know what you're getting into, but once stuff is really starting to go sideways and you're really confused and, and then you know what it is, they're not really experts at pulling heartstrings. They're just experts at being all about themselves defensively and trying to strive to get what they need and seek identity through others, but they don't even know that consciously. So many people agree with that. Like Susie Q just said, you're absolutely right. Well, then you can keep giving your power away to them is what you're doing. They're not that powerful. Yeah, no, it is such a trauma bond. They are trauma bonds. And that's what makes everything so not simple. Um, well, I'm really glad, Hoker Hoker, that <laughs> you go, oh, yes, you did. I wasn't trying to say, no, I didn't, but um, I'm glad I really helped you to understand. That's what the videos are for. And you're very welcome. And Jonathan, you're welcome. I meant, um, Deborah, AJ, can you talk about paranoia and projection in the borderline or in borderlines? Why are they so paranoid? Well, first of all, who says they're paranoid? They're extremely distrustful, but I don't know. Does that equal paranoia? Um, fear of abandonment drives that. Um, it, it, it relates, it does, first of all, it doesn't, re, it relates to projection in a secondary cause and effect way, because it's more to the point that they're triggered first and that goes back to their past. And, but when they get triggered in that dissociative way, which is within BPD that I'm talking about, then they get all these feelings and they don't know what the heck it's from. And so then they're going to put it out onto you. So that can, you know, they can have some paranoia, but not all people with BPD do. But they don't trust. And so that distrust can come across like paranoia, but it can definitely be a lot of false accusations. It's another reason why being with an untreated person with BPD is a relational impossibility. Because everything they feel... A lot of it coming from the past. All their anxieties about trying to be close, which they don't know how to do, or take distance, fear of abandonment, the approach avoidance conflict. So all this stuff is going on within them, and you can't understand what it is because they can't put it in words either. And then, so all that they end up experiencing in these triggered, dysregulated emotional times and or the episodes they have gets projected out immediately because they don't know what to do with it. And they've been projecting it out like that since the woundedness occurred to them, like it happened to them, I should say. And so I think that um, there's a lot of distrust that doesn't necessarily always mean paranoia. So, and, and some can be comorbid with a uh, paranoid personality, which then it's like a triple, like, that, that, that's a disaster, that. Um, and other than that, um, they make a lot of false accusations. So it can seem like it's out of paranoia. It's really out of this lack of trust. And the other thing I would say about what can appear to be, I'm not saying there's never paranoia in some people with BPD, but within BPD itself, without maybe paranoid personality, it's not like a staple feature. Uh, but they can be in their triggered iterations of emotional dysregulation and dissociative re-experiencing of feelings that they can't tell the difference between that they're from the past, the feelings, and what's going on in the here and now, then it can really look paranoid, but, they, but that level of distrust is really coming from, you know, the fact that they couldn't trust a parent, and then they don't know that, so they project it out onto you. It's it's really hard to describe at the very base of it, but I hope that was a little bit helpful. Um, <clears throat> Ian, this chat room is actually very encouraging and strengthening. I can feel it. Well, I'm glad, Ian. And Shadow Moses, um, some more good recommendations for Quiet BPD with AJ's video. Quiet equals, well, vulnerable narc. Did I say that? 
and a taking a break borderline with love. Oh, I don't know if I have one that says quiet BPD equals vulnerable narc, but you never know. Because it doesn't always, but it can. not um, Oh, I forgot about that one. I'll have to add it. Well, I can't add it to the list now, probably. Maybe I can edit it. Right. The taking the break borderline uh, with love. Uh, the interview with a codependent series. Um Oh, there was, uh, yeah, well, there's those three videos I did with the, uh, the ex of a person with BPD and what he was going through. And in hindsight, and I kind of knew at the time, that that dynamic actually, what was his name? I can't remember anymore. Three-part interview series, yeah. But it turns out that my, my suspicion there, my, I really think, that he's a narcissist and she was definitely a borderline. But I guess he was a codependent too, but like not all codependents are narcissists, right? Some are. And sometimes that's a dynamic. And, and, you know, he was, I mean, the behavior that he admitted to is not the average codependent behavior. Could I put it that way in those interviews? Um, oh, glad you're doing well, um, Shadow Moses. And, um, uh, Hoker Hoker, one question. About a year ago, I confronted him and told him I deserved better. He looked ashamed and said, yes, you did. Then he said, I'm sorry I made you chase me. He ghosted a lot. Well, and sometimes with a person with BPD, if they have any awareness, they don't always, they may know that they are ghosting like, they just, they just need to get out of there kind of thing, but that's hardly okay, right? Like, they need treatment, and they need to take adult responsibility. But they don't have the emotional intelligence to just communicate stuff. But the thing is, when he said, I'm sorry I made you chase me, that's, that's a real hint into that person with BPD psychology because they're not all the same, but he was looking to be chased or pursued in a way that likely his a parent or parents didn't do ever. Um, uh, Susie Q, well, it's, it's, you know, I mean, you said, I know you're right, AJ. Well, you know, it's not about me trying to sit here and be right or whatever. It's just, it's really, it's really hard, you know, when people are in these relationships and like, like you said, Susie Q, he's an alcoholic as well. It's like, you know, you got to really look at what's blocking you from leaving, you know, so, because it's really important for you to get out of there. Hoker, hoker, um, he then said he didn't feel good and looked ashamed, so he was aware of what he was doing. Um, well, there was some awareness there, yes. Did, did, you know, did he know that each time? Maybe. And if so, yeah, but there, but they don't all know that. So again, they're not all the same, but maybe he was aware. Um, or it sounds like he was, I would say. But I think, I can't remember who made the point now. I don't see the comment in front of me, but it's so important to stop psychoanalyzing them. And more to the point, doesn't help you to listen to the, um, unexpertise or lack of expertise of the exes online doing videos, um, telling you that they're going to psychoanalyze you by your comments. Just saying. Um, because I don't try to psychoanalyze people by their comments. That's silly. Oh, you've been taking a lot of wheels. He said, I just want to thank you for letting me be human. Well, you know, you you are human and you have that right. And if somehow I've supported and validated that for you, I'm glad. But um, it's not about me letting you be human. It's maybe me validating that you are human. And um, you said, I feel bad for being so affected by my trauma and stress sometimes. Uh, it's not often I get told my reactions are normal. I can appreciate that, yes. But I'm, I'm just here to validate and educate. I'm certainly not um, letting you be human. I just wanted you to know that because you are human and, and they don't maybe let you be you. That's not safe. But I think you understand what I mean. 
Um, North Glen, hey, Jay, everyone, checking in before I go to GV support group tonight. Just got done mediating and had their, uh, oh, meditating, sorry, meditating, not mediating, and had therapy. All helps with the rumination. Six months out, still trying to break the trauma bond. Yeah, and, and you know, good for you for keep keep moving forward, and you got the support group, and you're in therapy. And, you know, six months out, yeah, breaking that trauma bond is not a simple or quick thing, and it, it takes time. So you just keep working on it, and you'll get there. Um Deborah, AJ, um, you don't know at first they are borderline, so you don't know they are being manipulative in reference to pulling at heartstrings. Yeah, but they're not not—they're not all pulling heartstrings consciously, you know. So, again, maybe some are. They aren't all. But, no, I, I've acknowledged several times, and even a couple times in the stream, I think I've said, you don't know what you're getting into when you first, because you don't know. But again, as soon as you do know, then if they're still pulling on your heartstrings, and then then that becomes your responsibility. But in the beginning, no. Um, Hoker, Hoker, can you tell me what on earth he meant? He knew he was hurting me. He felt badly about it. He was ashamed. Why did he do it, knowingly hurting me and him? Well, again, you're saying knowingly. Okay, so at some point he gained some awareness. But he probably doesn't have the awareness of the actual great big question or answer to the great big why, which is that the repetition compulsion cycles in which he would be trying to relate from, for lack of a better way to put it, are, are things he doesn't have any control over. So I'm not trying to, you know, apologize for them at all or say what they do is okay at all, but... Um, he didn't do it all knowingly as in planned out, you know, and um, he did it because they do it because of their woundedness, which, you know, that explanation uh, doesn't seem very adequate. And I understand that to people that have been hurt by people with BPD because their woundedness is what they need to take responsibility to heal rather than visit it on other people. Well, thank you so much for that, Jonathan. Yeah, donation to your computer fund. Really appreciate your knowledge and efforts for both myself and the community. Well, thank you so much, and I really appreciate that. And, um, yeah, it, it was a bit of a pain because I do have a few other computers, but for for various reasons, um, yeah, I had to order another one, like, like the one that just died. It was so my fault, you know. I'm looking at, I think there was something I saw that was like the warranty. And I'm like, I can't claim warranty on this. I dropped it on the floor or something like eight, ten times. And it wasn't until probably the 11th time or whatever that it lost its mind, turned pink, and barely could turn on and was doing all kinds of funny things. And I'm like, but I still managed to get, <clears throat> I think I have to try to turn it on once more, get a little more of the information off. That was the main thing. And I don't know. It was just it, it was an Acer gaming laptop. It was a really good laptop because I don't game, but um, when you're rendering videos, they go much quicker on this kind of a laptop. And I don't know what it was about it that I dropped it so many times, or I had it on the side of a chair or a part of a de- and it just fell. It was like it was trying to kill itself or something. But thank you for the donation. Always appreciate it and. Uh, yeah, so I ordered another one, and right now I have, and I have this other computer too, but like you can't adjust the brightness on it. It's keeping me awake. Well, of course I'd be awake here. Um, this is an HP Omen um, gaming laptop, which again is for video rendering. So, yeah, anyway, I had to get another one. And uh, then I have some other laptops I use for other things, but like maybe if I'm just doing web work or something, but... If you get yourself the... Uh, I'll get off laptops in a second. I just want to make one other point. I have such an associate of mine. If I I was always using... Like, I have desktops, but I don't always want to sit there. And the thing is, there's a... So if you just use a regular, even desktop or laptop, the amount of time it takes to render a video... Oh, my God. Like, and on these gaming computers, it, it, it just, like, it's maybe two or three minutes versus, like, 45. So... That's the good news on that front. Anyway, 
Um, hey there, roller girl. Short on the words, but lots of emoticons. Just, just something I noticed, not a criticism. Um, to each their own, for sure. Um, no, that's okay, Wheels. You don't have to find a quiet BPD video, because... People can just go on the community tab and they're all listed there, or, or a lot of them. I don't know if that's all I've done or not, because I don't remember. So I'm approaching 550, 550 videos here. So I guess one, you know, one thing I like to say, but people don't always listen to, like they might not listen to this live stream, but one thing that would be really cool is when you're watching a certain video on a certain topic, if you want more on that topic, it would be good to put that right there as opposed to some other topic, because I can't always keep track of it all. And the other aspect of that would be, um, yeah, check around more of my videos. Or if, if there's a subject you're watching a video on that I've done, and you want to hear more about it, then just put in the search bar above, you know, on YouTube, um, Quiet Borderlines, AJ Mahari, or, or Codependence and Borderlines, AJ, and you'll just see there's so many more, you know, so... And a lot of what the newer YouTubers are talking about, I've already covered that ground ages ago. So I will I will recover ground a lot because there's many different perspectives and ways to look at things. But yeah, no, that's okay. Thank you for uh, for offering wheels. But people can just go to the community tab. Whoops, don't want to leave that up all day. Okay. Um, Shadow Moses, my bad. Sorry about that, AJ. It was quiet. B it was quiet. BPD question mark or vulnerable narc? Yeah, question mark. Codependent and ruminating, not equals. Yeah, because because you know, in some cases, whether quiet, discouraged, like or acting out or whatever that all the types are, but those two key ones, whether it's quiet borderline or or the externalizing acting out borderline. They may or may not have comorbidity with NPD at all. So, like, some do, and most don't. But, yeah, thank you for, yeah, because I remember I did those three kind of in a series. There was, I forget what the third one was, but yes. And I was asking the question. Yeah, because I don't believe it's true that ipso facto a quiet borderline equals a vulnerable narcissist, which is just more misinformation out there in general. And I, and I think one other thing I should just say on the point of misinformation, not to dwell on that or to mention anybody out there, but just to say that I have 30 plus years of client work that goes with this as well. And so it's really hard in my videos compared to when people work with me and, and they become a client of mine. Um, it's so much, they'll learn so much more from me and, and not only get help, you know, get help, et cetera. Because it's more nuanced to the individual that they've been with with BPD or more nuanced to what they've gone through as opposed to what I'm saying, you know, broadly out here, which is more difficult to really speak to why I keep saying they're not all the same. I'm not saying that one is going to be better relationally if they're untreated than the other, but... Um, An off fee. You cannot engage them without getting abused. Well, again, uh, most of them or many of them, but they're not all the same. But but yes. And and what people need to know about that is like what you just said there. You you certainly found out in, in your own experience with that person that was in your life with BPD or might be still that you can't engage that person without getting abused. And that's very true for very many, but not all. But, but untreated, yeah, more more likely than not, one way or another, sooner or later. Um, Hoka Hoka, looking back, the divorce was just finalized a month ago. I can see that I was in a horribly toxic mess. Well, I'm really sorry to hear that, but the good news is that you've been able to get yourself out of that. And, and now it's just, you know, going forward and, you know, one day at a time and a healing journey, which is healing and recovery, which is really going to be... Um, you know, it's, it's your journey. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it was, I'm sorry to hear that you were in a horribly toxic mess. Uh, Deborah, the outcome of a relationship with someone who has BPD is always bad. Well, again, untreated, definitely. And, um, 
Yeah, they're like the title of the live stream is the relational impossibility of the untreated borderline. And I'm not kidding. It is relationally impossible. They don't love you. They can't love you. They didn't love you. They can't feel your love. They won't take it in. They don't trust it. I mean, they don't know how to be close. They you get, get a little close and then, oh, they got to pick a fight or something or they'll ghost you. Um, and then, oh, you know, fear of abandonment if there's distance or you're not paying enough attention to them. So, yeah, it's relational impossibility. So in that regard, nothing's going to end positively for sure. Um, Ian, it's quite amazing the amount of quality videos you pump out. Oh, thank you. I will look into having a session with you. Well, if you decide to, I'll be happy to speak with you. Um, of course, I've been around for a long time, so I didn't pump them all out last Tuesday, right? But, yeah, I've been doing more recently, and because uh, I think it helps in the algorithm, too. Um, and um, some of them, yeah, like somebody asked me, uh, com made a comment on one the other day, which I will have to look at. I haven't had a chance yet. It's an 11, 10 or 11 year old video. So I'm like, okay, well, I have to go back and watch that to see what they, you know. And interesting enough, too, you know, like, uh, there's this, I don't, I don't really take issue with people vilifying borderlines, except that each person should focus on the one that was in your life because they're not all the same. But, um, and, and what I mean by that is some are getting treatment and some are in a place of awareness getting treatment because I know I, because I work with many of them too. And they aren't in relationships anymore. They know they have to stay out of relationships until they keep healing and recover more or get to healed and recovered. So that's that's one thing. And then there are people that are in treatment and going forward, and usually they're not in a relationship at that time either. So, um, And, um, yeah, what is uh Yeah, I can't remember what I was going to say about that. But anyway, um... Oh, well, thanks, older girl. I, it, the computer I'm on right now, I've had for like five months. Just haven't used much. And uh, the new one, well, be lucky if it gets here by the middle of next week. So you never know with them because, you know, I just use a shopping channel in Canada. So, you you know, you get to break up the payments over four months or six months or whatever. It's not like I'm shelling out $2,000 here and $2,000 there because, you know, I do okay and make make a living and I survive, but I'm not charging the kind of money I could to the point where because I'm not in it. There's, to do this work for people and with people, it's it's not about getting rich, you know. So I just thought I'd mention that. It's not like with all these computers I have, like you know, I paid them all off and installed them. It's really the truth of that matter. But anyway, thank you. I didn't want to have to order another one, but. Uh, it's not as good as the last one, so but it was a showstopper of the day. I went over to the channel, like on the internet. I don't watch it on TV, and uh, I'm like, I need an I need another Acer and a gaming computer, and, and and it was like I wanted that one, right? But I remember it was not that cheap, and this one is probably everything that that one was with just a little less speed, and only half the hard drive space. So you know, but it was a showstopper, so it'll be. Uh, you know, they took like 500 bucks off it or whatever. I thought that's good enough because I've got bigger. I'm going to get an eight terabyte external hard drive next because I got a four terabyte, like these really big things. And so I'll just offload and, and keep that computer for just video rendering. The only thing is you have to have all the pictures and stuff that you need and everything all ready to go. Anyway, enough about that stuff. Um, so it's really easy for me to do videos. And, and yeah, one other thing I'll just mention here. Why do I do a lot of podcast videos? Why do I do a lot of podcast live streams? Because I spend sometimes eight plus hours a day with clients, you know, staring into the camera. And my neck just can't take anymore. So just in case anybody wondered about that, not that I think it's on the top of your mind. Hey there, Victor, how are you? You said my ex said she was going to be a lawyer. And end up in Capitol Hill as Secretary of Education. She still doesn't even have her bachelor's. I'm sorry to hear that. I shouldn't have giggled there. Is that manic or magical thinking or both? It has nothing to do with um, mania. It has everything to do with just maybe that's what she really wanted to do. Maybe that's like a goal of hers. But there's just 
too much in the way, you know, and maybe she hasn't been able to function. Maybe she hasn't been able to, um, you know, if she wanted to do that, maybe it's not what she wants to do anymore either, but a little bit of grandiosity there, I guess, but, um, and she said that, I don't know, does she, you know, if she would still maintain that, that would be different, but no, it's not about mania. Um, it's not really magical thinking either. It sounds like it's just a, you know, a goal that she had and, um, but she, her reality is that she's having too much difficulty um, because I guess if, if she still hasn't even got a bachelor's, then either she has no ability to commit to the process of education to get where she wants to go, or she might just think magically it could happen somehow, but magical thinking, it could be a little bit of that in the sense that if they feel something, they think it's real. But it just sounds to me like she might have had a, a desire to be something, but hasn't got the ability to function to get there. Um, Deborah, AJ, the new Mac with the M1 chip, the best for video processing. Oh, yeah, well, I have an iMac and two two MacBooks, and, and they're probably not the new thing, but I can't render videos on a Mac because this will sound stupid, but the software I use on PCs, I can't even figure, I could figure it out, but I can't be bothered trying to figure out iMovie. Every time I've tried to do anything on a Mac with video, it's like, forget it. I mean, I used to live stream off one of my MacBooks a lot. I could go, well, I could do that again, actually. But um, as for processing video on a Mac, nah, not my thing. I know people do amazing things. Some people do like a lot on an iPad, but I don't get along well with the Mac system or the in terms of video production, or the iMovie at all. And yet, it doesn't differ greatly from all the other software that you can use to render videos, but I just don't have a look. I just, it frustrates me, and I'm like, I'm out of here. So I haven't touched my iMac or MacBook Pro for, for, uh, rent, for anything to do with videos in ages. But I'll bet it is amazing. I mean, I have no doubt about that. But so are these gaming PCs amazing for it, too. Um, this one I'm on right now, it's like, wow, you know what I was saying last night? I can't read these comments. It was like, this one is crystal clear. The display is so freaking bright. I can see everything. <laughs> um, Shadow Moses uh, to Deborah. Oh, about, yes, Deborah's comment got deleted again somewhere. So you're saying. Um <laughs> I was just going to say, when you get a comment deleted because you ask a question, and then you get what you say next, which is very appropriate, and you get that deleted, chances are after that you get blocked by those type of people. Yeah, well, I mean, emojis, you're the emoji queen, roller girl, that okay, but emojis, I mean, I use them now and again, but hardly ever, and... And that's just me, and you love them, and that's you, and that's fine. Um, I just, you know, yeah. Um, Ian, you'll send yourself crazy asking why. Even if you ask them, well, you can't really find the truth by asking them, because the truth is, if they're untreated, they don't have the answers at all. So there's that, too. You know, it's not like they just won't tell you. They can't tell you. And then the lack of emotional intelligence where uh, people with BPN treated, they don't have um, the communication skills or the meta communication skills. They can't make it. How can a person, I always hearken back to this, how can a person without a self make an I statement? Like, I feel da, 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 when, you know, because you said and or check it out with you. They don't have self-reference, so they don't have other reference. So it's it's all a mess in between. Not really in between. It's that you become like their identity. And then, which is a very young, childlike reality. And then, when and they don't do this consciously. And then when you don't agree with them, it's like all of a sudden they feel like they don't know who they are anymore. Not that they do, but they're trying to get that sense of who they are through you. 
Um, wheels, yeah, that's way better, way better, sorry, that's a better way to put it. I'm so used to having basically, oh, I can usually read. I'm so used to having to basically act like nothing ever ha affects me. I've been very burnt out because of it. It's nice when it doesn't feel I have to do that. Well, yeah. Oops, I just totally like scrolled just a bit. It went flying up there. Hang on a second. Where was I? There's really no such thing, Deborah's quote, BP thinking, unquote. Um, it's not really a descriptor. Uh, down the rabbit hole. There. Uh, hey there. Uh, what what I the difference between? Uh, what is the difference between BPD and MPD in women? Well, let me just firstly say, women are not this, you know, study unto themselves of BPD and the, and and that men with BPD are all different than that. So, the difference between BPD and NPD is the difference between BPD and NPD. Whether a man or a woman or probably an alien has it. You know what I'm saying? Um, there are vast differences. I can't really list them all here. I mean, I could, but it would take a long time. Um, but, and let me think. Um, a key difference is that people with BPD do have, most of them, a capacity for empathy. It doesn't mean they're going to be having empathy for you when they're triggered. That's for sure. And people with NPD are more... They're, they're, so, so people have, with BPD are sort of like this jumbled up mess of trying to relate, trying to find love, trying to connect, but they can't get any of that done, untreated. And people with NPD have a more, uh, so, so their arrested development happens at a different age and stage of development, and they have much more elaborate defenses, and basically they transact with people. So they're not even really into the, the, the amount of feeling that most people with BPD are with it. So that's one stark difference. Um, and then, you know, the overt narcissist is, you know, the grandiosity is the major defense mechanism there, whereas a major defense mechanism in BPD is splitting. So that's just a couple, but, like, I really can't <clears throat> give long answers on a live stream or then... I won't get to anybody else's comments, etc. But but I have a couple videos on that, and I mean to do more, and I mean to do more on comorbidity as well. So, and all I'm trying to lay out here on this channel is that it's important that people don't think that the person with BPD, especially if diagnosed with it, is all of a sudden NPD or ASPD or all this other stuff because they're in this mood or that mood or they did this thing or that thing because it's really highly inaccurate. But I guess it's the sensationalism that people want to buy into today, largely on other channels. Um, well, I don't think BP women can hurt you more than an art would hurt you, but then that's a comparison really that doesn't have any comparative reality to it unless you've been with both a narcissistic um, woman and a BPD woman but I've heard that out there that you know and some people say oh the borderline's the worst of all but it's all pretty bad let's just you know hopefully we can agree on that but I don't think that people with BPD generally hurt people more than narcissists do but then again I'm not somebody who's into comparing um, people's, you know, pain. Hey there, Luke. Um, my wife has BPD. The other day I rang her after a two-week break as she split, so I just got out of there. Oh, a man answered her phone and started abusing me, calling me an abuser, cheater. Um, I've not done that. I'm so sorry to hear that, though. Oh, man, I'm so sorry that happened. Uh... Would she ever come back to me? Well, put it this way, Luke. I know that it's compelling. And um, and by the way, I'll be getting back to you soon, too. Um, I know it's compelling, and but like you're really better off if she would never come back to you. So, But I know that's hard to hear right now. I'm just sorry for what you just experienced. Um, 
Oh, no. Deborah, you have to be a narc to have a relationship with a BPD woman, but the narc still ends up losing. No, no, no. I don't know what YouTuber you were listening to on that. It's not true. It's not true at all. BPDs do not have the ability to abuse as much, on average, as the narcissist does. So, again, it's sort of like, I don't know who's saying what out there, but, um, you know, that wherever that information is coming from, I've had so many clients that I speak to recently, and someone on the channel here has said many times, they feel really hurt and bad because they feel like if they could have been more like a narc, if they could have been worse to the person with BPD, they would have been loved or the relationship would have worked out. It's just not true. It's just not accurate. And so um, when narcissists get involved with people with BPD, it's a trauma bond on steroids and it doesn't work for either of them. And people with BPD get almost pretty much as hurt as codependents do, more often than not. So... Um, no, people with be uh, narcissistic personality don't lose to borderlines. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I can see whatever. No, it's it's just, oh, it's kind of. I'm not even going to speak to that information out there anymore. It's really just not. No. Um. Shadow Moses. Um. Stream title, which explains why in some or in my case, discarded years of relationship, friendship, like nothing. Well, it's because they don't attach. It's because they don't know how to love. It's because they're seeking identity through you, which they don't know. And all of this means that in a heartbeat, like, and the repetition compulsion cycles of most of BPD, there's, well, all really, because there's an apex of rupture that happens in the apex synchrony and the misattunement from infancy on that means all relationships must rupture and and this isn't something that's consciously known by untreated people with bpd either but every time they start a relationship it's going to end in a rupture it's not going to work out it's repetition compulsions they don't have they 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 haven't gotten through the early stages of childhood development to know how to have a relationship or relate or be friends and of course that's most, not all, because some can be fr have friends, and you know, so yeah, so it just depends if they're getting any treatment or not, too. Um, people with BP are definitely all or nothing, black and white. Um, Luke even got a call from police saying that she has seen. Me stalking her and my son, but I'm 1,500 um, kilometers away. Oh, man. She's, uh, well, you know, I mean, I hope that you're able to see your son, but, you know, you better got to watch out for this one. She's one of those ones where, you know, the capacity to lie to the cops, the capacity to exaggerate to the cops, uh, you got to be really careful with this one. Um, because they're not all the same. Empath pepperizing. <clears throat> Excuse me, borderlines are narcissist karma. They deserve each other. Well, you know, I, I've often wondered if narcissists, you know, and this in this day and age, they have all the information from the internet, right? So I think a lot of them might target borderlines if they, you know, figure that part out. But, um, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess saying it's karma makes sense in a way, but I just don't think it's true what some people say that the borderline is going to, you know, just lot it over the narcissist and that kind of thing. And then there's other people out there saying that, you know, the only person that a borderline will stay with or a borderline woman, um, is a narcissist, which is ridiculous and not true at all because, but to, to the fact of how they'll be abusing each other in that regard, I guess it is karma. Hey there, car girl. Uh, how you doing? Uh, Victor, she said that when she left me, I believe it's still a goal, but 
let me tell you, to be Secretary of Education, oh, okay, um, is about, you know, is about who you, you know. Well, this would be true, yes. The president appoints someone to that position. That's crazy. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, there's definitely something there that, that could be, you know, in BPD, that would be overcompensatory, um, thinking about or, or belief or there is some modicum. It's not the same as NPD of grandiosity in there, but she's being overcompensatory thinking that likely she's better than she is because she can't even get the bachelor's done. But you're right. That, I mean, that is something that someone would have to work their way up and be able to do transactional relationships and in quote politics, unquote, anyway, but, yeah, a lot of those jobs are about who you know, not what you know. And therein lies the Peter Principle. You know, incompetence rises to the top. Um, well, and her thinking that far ahead is, let me just say, uncharacteristic for people with BPD. But some are more high-functioning than others. But uncharacteristic that they can usually have a clear goal. And clearly, even if that was a goal of hers, it's not anything she's going to be able to actualize. Um, empath uprising, wanting a borderline back. Well, you know, people are in their own. I hear you. And you know, you know better, right? And But we have to be patient and understanding of people that haven't got through that yet. Because these trauma bonds are really profound and really difficult and... Many people do want them back. Many people go back and try again and again. And, of course, that's not a good thing. And it's not going to change anything. But I guess as a professional, I have to be careful to say, I have to keep on, you know, putting forward, you know, compassion and empathy to people who are in that position. Because I hear you, Empath Uprising. But, you know, other people don't know what you know just yet, right? So everybody's in their own place and time and space. And uh, Hoker Hoker, he had a moment of clarity before I finalized the divorce. For the first time ever, he made sincere, heartfelt apologies. We both did. We forgave, made our peace. I pray the best for him. Well, and, and that can happen, and that's positive. And the main thing about that is that, you know, sincere, heartfelt apologies, I hear you. Um, but I'm glad that you, you know, kept going forward regardless. Well, Deborah, I always get a lot more people watching than I get likes. So, you know, not what I'm focused on or how many dislikes I get. Like, I couldn't care less. I'm here to stand for what I stand for. And everybody, everybody doesn't like it can, you know, kiss my, you know what, frankly. So there's a lot of passive people out there, too. Codependent bond response. Don't even hit the like button. Listen, learn, uh, like, and don't like. The, don't hit the like button. So what can I say? You know, I'm not really going to worry about it. Um, yeah, hang in there, Luke. And I'm, I'm going to be getting to you really soon. Like, really soon. I'm sorry. It's been a bit of a delay. And I hope I can be helpful to you. Uh, Shadow Moses. Curious, AJ. Um, Ken... Poverty and toxic family background also be a factoring environment to possibly developing BPD. Well, toxic family background is usually what's required, you know, dysfunctional family of origin. And um, poverty, I wouldn't say I would add that in because are some toxic dysfunctional families of origin also living in poverty and stressed by that? Yeah. But then what about all the families that, or even in the past, lots of poverty, but they still love their children and they still were able to meet their children's needs. So I don't think poverty is a pivotal factor, but, you know, it's more the toxic dysfunctional family. And then if there's poverty too, it's only going to make it worse. Um Victor, it's more impossible to be Secretary of Education than to win the lottery because it's in someone else's hands. Well, and winning the lottery would be up in the air, wouldn't it? But I hear you, you know. Um, 
Empath Uprising, I notice my ex borderlines always uh, hoover when they sense a moment of weakness, even if they have to fabricate or imagine it. Has that been your experience, AJ? Um, well, not my own personal one, but I will say for many clients I've worked with over 30 years, yes, it comes up a lot. It's like, you know, and just when I'm working with a client who's just really starting to feel a little bit better and take back a little more of their ground in themselves, uh, if they haven't gone full no contact, then the Hoover comes. And, and there's many ways to look at that, but I think sometimes, like, people with BPD, even untreated, they, they can sometimes be very accurate in how they will read people, which is owing to the fact of hypervigilance in childhood and trying to find a way to stay safe often. So it might be that, it might be that they have a gauge on energy, so to speak, or it could be absolutely coincidental. But then the way that it's been reported to me so many times, it doesn't seem like a coincidence. So I think that that can happen. And it's it's probably something that isn't 100% explainable. But I think I think they do have a sense, you know, and... And then it, it could be a projection of how they're feeling, but it could coincide with the fact that maybe somebody has just thought about them. You know, I, it's hard to say because I don't think they're psychic or anything. Um, Wheels, AJ, I'm pretty sure you have more computers laying around than I do. Um, well, yeah, it's kind of a sad thing that. I mean, I'd like to be a minimalist. I just have too much stuff. But, I I mean, I'm not acquiring it. I'm not, you know, hoarding stuff. But, yeah, because I've been working online for so long. I mean, there's three desktops in here that are so operable, but I don't use all the time. And then there's two or three in the closet. I forget which. And there's probably five or six old laptops. Now I got a half-dead laptop that, you know, will just go in the closet with the others, I guess, for now. And. Oh, geez, I hate to admit this, but in my other room, there's the two iMacBooks, I, the, the MacBook Pros. Uh, one I use for entertainment, but I haven't used it lately much to watch much. And uh, I think there's, yeah, another Dell and another Acer in there, laptops, but eh. It's like me and iPhones wheels. I can't explain it. It's kind of like really stupid. It's, it's a little bit like nutty. Anyway. Um, I do need a few iPhones, but uh, but beyond that, no. Um, uh, Ian, uh, you said your neck hurts at times. Um, yeah, it definitely does. I have a long-term neck injury. So do I. That's the problem. And finding these exercises awesome. Oh, search for a three-minute neck drill that will change your life on YouTube. Oh, I definitely will look into that. Because I know that uh, at least I've been able to make it without a chiropractor, like even pre what's going on in the world. But um, it, it's just, I, yeah, I do have a chronic neck issue. And then, from, from a car accident a lot of years ago, maybe on top of which was um, some athletic injuries too. But I think um, one of the things that hurts my neck the most these days is hours and hours of client work staring into cameras. Because I'm just too long in the same position. It's really... It's really hard, but I'll, I'll check into that, and thank you for mentioning that. Um, Victor, my point is that I relate to that guy that was saying my ex was manic because I felt the same thing when my ex told me she'd do the impossible, laugh out loud. Well, I, I don't know why people would equate mania with the impossible because there's a lot of other ways people can get to thinking, like in BPD, things that are essentially impossible for them and they just don't realize it yeah this screen is better but but now i realize that yeah that's the other screen was who knows like i said i dropped the computer so many times and maybe the screen i think maybe i didn't have i didn't have it turned up bright enough or it was already kind of starting to mess up but the, the only thing about the hp omen in case anybody ever wants to get one or if you're a gamer I guess if you're a gamer, it doesn't matter, but there is no display. There's a display setting on this laptop, and it's called, there you go. There's no way to adjust it, because it's a, it's a tad bright for me, 
But like, um, yeah, there's no, that's why I decided to get the, the new Acer that's going to come because I'm like, I, I know that for when I'm working on a computer for longer than a live stream or, you know, I've used this computer a little bit more in the last few days, but Without a brightness, it, like, like I've looked everywhere, and, and this this laptop comes with one brightness setting, period. So, but yeah, I, I can definitely read the comments better right now while well, I'm being half-blinded by the light. Um, Ian, right, she never shares how she feels verbally, but has no problem using text messages occasionally. Well, and sometimes they might express more there, but they still don't get into the nuances of, mature or healthy communication um and to the extent that they would if they ever got you know significantly treated or got to healing and recovery so um deborah aj i noticed your subscribers have grown 400 in the last week or so really i don't know what i'm at right now it's grown a couple thousand in the last maybe two months or something but there are quite a bunch a lot of them and then there's been a lot more comments on the channel. And the really interesting thing about that, somebody left a comment last night on a video, oh, maybe three years old, two, I don't remember. And they said, I, I know this is an older video, so I'm sure this comment won't be seen. I just happened to be doing something on my computer at that time. Might have been one or so in the morning, I don't remember, last, but, you know, last night, so to speak. And I saw, and then I just popped over to see if there was anything there, and I, and I saw it, and it was like, and two minutes later, I replied to it, because, yeah, I do see comments, because it tells me there's a comment, and, and the video could be 11 years old, and I'll still get the comment. But the only thing with that is, sometimes then, I can't find it later to answer it, because they just don't, they sometimes line up the comments according to videos, and I'm like, where'd that comment go? So, because there's another one out there right now I'd like to answer, and I can't find it. So, it's how it goes. Um, but, uh, yeah, the channel is growing, but then there's there's people that watch. So, some of my recent videos, some videos are better watched than others, obviously, and then some are left alone, and they're lonely. And then people are finding me through the older videos first because they're probably pushed more in the algorithm. And, of course, some of them... <laughs> I know some people get a hundred thousand likes in a day if they have like a million viewers or something. But I have one video out there that's over a hundred hundred thousand views that's eleven it just took eleven years to get there. But it's probably not getting viewed that much now. Anyway. Uh down the rabbit hole. After they split into into Oh, after they split you, can they return to the other side of the split? Well, there again is, is you know, a high variant in, in the differential between different people with BPD. So some can and some will. They will idealize, well, not like the original idealization, but they will then split the devaluation and then they might come back to idealizing you, but not like the first idealization. And then some people just go from split the value to kind of coming back to a base of it doesn't reach idealization, but it come they come out of the devaluation cycle. So again, it's very individual, actually. And Luke, I don't want my BP wife back. I'm sorry, it's just so confusing. I wish I had AJ's insights years ago. Well, um, yeah, I mean, and... And definitely when you phone and then there's, you know, that, well, I don't want to say too much. Don't know who it was and don't want to put thoughts in your head. So, um, but definitely, you, you know, we can talk about that really soon. Um, you get an email from me pretty, like, by tomorrow. Um, uh, Deborah, I'm being facetious tonight, AJ. You're taking my comments too literally. Um, if you're being facetious and I'm reading text, how am I supposed to know that? Well, if I am taking them too literally, well, okay, but like, I don't know. I can't, you know, how am I supposed to know? <laughs> anyway, um, down the rabbit hole, um, question, people with BPD, do they want supply like NPD people do? No. That's another major difference, actually. 
Um, it can look similar, but they're really more in a childlike place. And, and they have a false self too, but the narcissist false self is stronger. And except for the vulnerable, I guess, you know, different types of narcissists in some degrees. But the thing is that, um, no, they're not really looking for supply, but they are needy, 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 needy. Narcissists are needy too, but it's in a different way. So um, I, they want attention and they want, and because unconsciously what they're doing is relating to you like you're a parent. So they get into this, you know, young emotional place that they're not aware of consciously. And then when they're relating to you, like they, like if you, if you know, if you don't pay attention to them or if you want to go to another part of the house or like when you have to work, some people at BPD are so clingy that way and so needy, but it's not a want for quote supply. It's, it's a want for love and attention, sort of like a young child, but either way, it's, it's not a very, um, it's not positive not a positive experience for other people. Um, Shadow Moses, it's a trauma response on a majority on what they do. Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, in metaphor, it's like wearing a VR helmet um, and us partners in Crossfire. Um, could be, I don't know <laughs> what a VR helmet is, but um, it is a trauma response. And so, as I've explained in some videos through object relations, what is really clear, I'm sure clear as much people in the relationships, but at the time, but they are really, you become, when you get close to somebody with untreated BPD, you become, quote, object other. You become the, per, whichever parent, doesn't matter your gender, wherever they're having the most difficulty from their childhood, they're going to they're gonna relate to you as if you are that parent. And of course, that is not something that they know consciously either. Um, Trev, how do I make my BPD wife, how do I make my BPD wife, it's important not to use our small boy as a chess piece, and it's very important for me to be in his life, so how do you make her get that, I guess, or how do you, I, well, I don't know if you can make her get that, I mean, I hope that, you know, you've got some legal proceedings going on, that you can get a custody arrangement, that usually has to, you know, People more often than not have to do that legally. And, um, yeah, you know, I'm so sorry to hear that's going on because so many untreated women with BPD who are mothers, they will use the children like chess pieces or pawns. And, and yeah, so it sounds like from your question, she's parentally alienating you. And the only remedy to that actually is through a court. And then men face a harder time. But many men, depending where you are in the world, not enough yet, but some men will get a 50-50 custody arrangement, if not more. But it's more rare that it's more. But you need to really go after that, legally speaking. You're never going to get her to get it, unfortunately. Um, Luke, I'm not a narc after learning from these videos. It's confronting, but... Um, I'm codependent as heck. I wish I did all different. Well, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that you might have thought you were a narcissist because so many people with BPD, that's what they're saying to people these days. Um, as the internet is, is not helping, it's helpful, yes, but it's also there's the other side of it. doesn't help people with BPD to figure their way out of a wet paper bag and they call everybody a narcissist. And, you know, it doesn't help everyone on the other side either because there's all that misinformation out there. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to say your name there, but do um, borderlines doubt their feelings when triggered? Well, when they're triggered, they're so flooded with feelings that they get lost to the feelings because they don't know what's happening to them. So they think that the person closest is responsible for how they feel. So the thing is, um, yeah, their feelings get thrown up in the air and all messed up, so to speak, when they get triggered. So they can feel very differently about somebody when they're triggered versus when they're not. 
So, yeah, they do doubt their feelings because they get thrown into this vortex of not knowing why they feel what they feel, which for them is usually panic-inducing to other things, and then they externalize it. Empath Uprising, guys, um, let's give AJ some love. The woman works her tail off for us. Well, thank you for that. But, you know, many people will still sit there, listen, learn, and never hit the like button. It's, um, I don't know, is it just me or is it the way it goes? <laughs> um, Wheels, I feel like living um, with a cluster B is like looking at the world through funhouse mirrors. You're seeing something, but it doesn't look anything like reality. Yeah, well put. Um, one life, um, this seesaw of either feeling connected to others or hating everyone is debilitating. Yes, it is. It really is. And, and if you're speaking in the first person, um, if that's your experience, um, you need to really get in therapy so that you can, you know, understand what's happening for you and learn how to connect to others without, you know, the, the, the hating everyone, you know, that, that, that part is debilitating because it ruins, ruptures, and destroys relationships as well as sometimes really um, impacting people negatively, to put it mildly. Uh, hoker, hoker. We're all in the chat and have to um, exit to, quote, like the stream. Likes will probably go up after this wraps. Yeah, for some people on some devices, that's very true. So I'm not worried about it. Um, I don't want to give power to the depravity of needing to bang thumbs down. Because, eh, you know, whatever their issue is, it says more about them and I don't care. Um, Empath Uprising, you're right, AJ. I literally had to pick my entire life and oh, pick up my entire life and move across the country to get away from my borderline. It still took about six months to stop um, craving the trauma bond was that strong. Yeah, well, I'm really sorry you went through that, but, you know, now you're in an empowered place, right? And healed, or I'm pretty sure healed, it looks like to me when I see your channel. So, um, and, um, yeah, you're, you're amazing what you do on your channel. And, uh, I'll just throw it out there. I've been thinking, maybe I'll contact you because maybe like, I would love to interview you. And, Especially if you would, you know, about what you're doing now, but also if you'd be willing to talk about how you got over that borderline. If you're interested, just thought I'd float that out there. Uh, Shadow Moses, because uh, I think I should do more collabs and more interviews. I think I'll be doing more interviews for sure. Uh, Shadow Moses, that makes sense. Thank you for the answer, AJ. You're welcome. Hoker, hoker, uh, relatively healthy families do exist. Um, toxicity is on a spectrum. Oh, I know, but like, come on, how much toxicity does it take to really affect a child? You know, that's a question. I have friends with highly functional families. They show respect and communicate. Yeah, I have this, I have friends like that too. And, um, and there are those people out there that grew up in those kind of families. But unfortunately, those kind of families might be just, if not more, tipping into the minority, which is a really sad statement to make. But yeah, definitely there are healthier people out there. And um, and then they're not the people that you involve with people with BPD or NPD in the first place. So that, because of the codependency factor. Um, and when people have a healthy family and they get through the early childhood stages of development in a relatively healthy way, then the world is their oyster compared to where everybody else might be coming from. Wheels, do you have any computers with floppy disk drives? No, not anymore. What I'm calling old is like maybe 10 years or so at the most. I don't know if I've got a 10-year-old computer anymore here. But um, no, I, it was no nope, nothing here with a floppy disk drive, so I'm not that bad. And um, really, I mean, if I had more time to get organized, I should find a place. Some of these computers still work. I just... You know what? You know what blocks me from getting rid of them is I don't ever have time to clean them off. You know, there's information. So I have a couple that are using their storage. I don't even know what's on them anymore. I should really clean them off, and if they still work, I should donate them. You know, to to shelters or places. You know, 
something like that. Um, and, and, and to your point too, Hoker Hoker, that relatively ha- healthy families do exist. Yes. But guess what? They're not the people that come and watch my videos and watch other people's videos. And they're not the people who are going to be in a live stream like this. I'm just saying. So it's not that we don't want to admit that, you know, or don't know that they exist. It's that they're out there in lives that aren't affected by all the things that people are, you know, hear about, right? And, and the pain they've been through. Uh, Shadow Moses, um, my, my quiet BP perceived, quote, sight, unquote, as person would lie. Overblown body language reading and a lot of WTF moments from me. Oh, uh, perceived your sight, my sight, as person would lie. Yeah, I don't know. Well, they they really, you know, the kind of childhoods that 87% of people diagnosed with BP have, don't uh, teach them how, and nor should they trust, actually, the family of origin that they grew up in. Because things go really wrong there, unfortunately. And, um... I'm like, where is this coming from? Crazy making. Well, yeah, it is. And, um, well, overblown body language reading. Yes, that can happen too. But you have to remember when a child is really traumatized, they develop a hypervigilance to trying to read the, and not always are they inaccurate, you know, with, with, with a parent or whatever. I mean, I had to go through that in my childhood. By the time I was like 10 or 12, I was always listening for when my father would come home and how hard did his feet hit the floor, what kind of mood was he in. And then when I would come home from school, I had to kind of watch it because I sometimes would come home to a pot flying at my head. What my mother, I didn't know what was going on with her, you know. So just a refresher in case people don't know or remember, my mother was BP, NPD. My father was a dark triad. So, and they were both alcoholics, which I forgot to say enough. But... um. So I was always trying, I mean, I was walking on huge eggshells there, and Lord knows I cracked a lot of them, and big trouble. But um, it, it is all crazy making, without a doubt. Because you can't know where it's coming from. Um, Alchemic Truth, I found your videos very useful last year as I struggled with my ex and breakup. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, Steffi, yes, I had the same thing. Uh, many seem to think they can read minds based on facial expressions who wants to apologize for their face all the time um well yeah nobody does um and you said oh i'm sorry my face told you that well yeah there can be a lot of misinterpretation and misreading and because if if you smile one minute and then maybe you're thinking about something else right and so your face changes then they think you know, kind of like fear of abandonment and whatever. And again, they're trying to get identity through you. So they, they lose all sense of self. Not that they have one anyways, untreated. But yeah, if, if your expression changes, then they'll think you whatever that, they'll think it means something about them. And they'll get all defensive. And so there's a lot of stuff that they absolutely don't um, process correctly or interpret correctly for sure. Uh, Steffi, yeah, it's funny, once you get some distance from it, well, yes, I guess it can be in hindsight. Um, Deborah, my BP accused me of being an addict. I asked her why, and she told me, um, because you forgot to put the car in neutral before turning it off. One of the books I read on BPD said they feel, if they feel it, is real. Um, well, that magical thinking is in BPD, that, that they feel what they feel is real. So there's no critical thinking there. No checking in with anybody. And um, there's always a boatload of false accusations. And they're more often than not projective. But whether she was an addict or not, I don't know. Well, I love how they, Shadow Moses, I love how they call it, quote, emotional reasoning, reasoning, unquote. Because that's an oxymoron on fire there. Because nobody, there's no emotional reasoning. It, it, it really, I don't know what it looks like in other iterations or something, but with people with BPD, it's, there's, there's no reasoning going on with all those emotions at all. 
But yeah, I know it's an interesting term, emotional reasoning. I mean, I guess we can, when, when we have a relative balance between our critical thinking skills and our emotions, maybe then we can have some emotional reasoning. But it's being tied together with probably what we're thinking about while we're feeling something. And of course, people with BPD are in that space where thoughts and feelings are totally separate. Black and white, usually. Um, Steffi, I felt like I was the parent, and all the anger he had about her was directed to me. Well, uh, yeah, you felt like that because you were right about that. At least that's how it felt. Ironically, his mother was the one who introduced us. Well, yeah, but he totally would have been projecting um, his issues with his mother onto you. Um, Ian, wearing a VR helmet and we get caught in a crossfire. Excellent analogy, totally. I guess it's one I'm not getting, but okay, cool. Um, Shadow Moses, AJ, um, VR, oh, vir oh, virtual reality helmet. Okay, yeah, I should have put that together. It's a simulation. Clear the jargon on my... Be her comment, haha. We get caught in the crossfire. Oh, I get it. Yeah, okay, get it now. Sorry, just didn't get it before. Um, Trev, it, it said we should consider our BP partner um, and be very careful how we communicate with them. What are your thoughts on this, please? Well, you can, yeah, that's, that's what a lot of places are. How can you help? the borderline, how can you love them, you know, how can you make the relationship work? Well, if they're untreated, it isn't going to work. But yeah, um, so if you're really careful how you communicate um, with them, my thoughts are uh, you can't avoid all the eggshells or the landmines. So you can be as careful as you want to be, you can communicate as skillfully as possible, and they're still going to go off because the triggers are inside of them. So, like, I've had so many clients say to me, you know, I read this book, I read that book, and it, it's, it's effing crazy because I did all that and nothing changed, and it got worse, and I don't think it's the most helpful advice out there. You know, it's like, just validate them, just validate them, just don't invalidate them. Well, you can try to validate them all day long, but, like, even when you're trying that, you know, different Uber ways of, to communicate to somebody with BPD, if they're not in treatment, it's not going to work. And the books don't say that, do they? Or the places where they recommend that don't say that. Um, hoker, hoker, exactly. Healthy people don't stick around for this type of relationship. Well, if they get into it at all, they get out early. Yes. Um, yes, well, you know, people have things happen and they get, co you know, they have codependency and then Yes, one needs to work on oneself and, and and make sure that you get a healthy relationship to and with yourself and heal that wounded inner child and and heal from the relationship. But when I work with clients, the amazing thing is that in the process I use, I mean, is that when people are working on the wounded inner child and or talking about the relationship and back and forth, it's like this multi-layered process because what people, when people are always focused on the cluster B or the borderline, we're always wondering why, 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 why. It's like the answer really lies inside of you and more to the point inside your wounded inner child. You'll get the answer to the big whys and it's not going to be from the cluster B and it's not going to be from hearing all about cluster or the, or the borderline forever in videos either. It's really that inner child healing, family of origin work and self-differentiation I'm always talking about. Um, oh, you were responding to someone who said, um, aren't all families toxic? Well, no, I don't think all families are toxic. I, someone said that here. I didn't see it. Sorry, I must have missed it. Um, yeah, and, um... Well, what Jonathan and Steffi are explaining or are describing there is exactly what it is that they're doing. People have untreated BP, but they don't know that. And nor do people who are in relationships at any given time um, or for a while know that you're actually getting a whole lot of stuff thrown at you 
um, that because, you know, and that they're trying to seek you to be, they're, they're really seeing you as a parent and they want you to be like a parent to them too. But again, that's not conscious in their minds. Whales, quote, walking, unquote, on eggshells is the hardest thing for me. As soon as a monster enters the room and a sense of peace goes out the window, I have to worry about every little thing and I'm so burnt out. I know it's, it's, um, can't really walk on eggshells because what happens with that is you walk on them for a little bit or people in relationship to people with BPD, it's a little bit different than your situation wheels can walk. You can walk on them a little, but then they start crunching under your feet and you know, the triggers and the chaos and the drama and all the pain, you know, that they hurl at you or the abuse they hurl at you that causes you pain. Maria, my ex also thought he had some sort of psychic ability and an ability to know what people were thinking and what their motivations were. Yeah, well, that's some magical thinking, and then, then again, something else. Because they don't know, you know. They, they, they clearly uh, really don't know what other people's motivations are. They don't even know what their own motivations are. Well, emotional reasoning equals emotional decision-making. Um, really, I would say that's an anathema, too, because emotional decision-making isn't really decision-making. It's reactions. It's just pure, unmitigated, impulsive reaction. Um, see how I believe words matter, right? I'm not, I'm not arguing with you. I mean, that, that's an interesting point you make there. But then when I go on to say something else, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue with you. I'm just, it's just me and words. I think, you know, I like to use specific words for specific reasons. And emotional decision-making isn't decision-making um, by and in and of itself. Um, Steffi, do some of the BPDs have psychotic breaks? Some do. Um, where they literally hear something you didn't say, but swear you said it, or think they saw something you did that they didn't do. Well, when they have a psychotic break, um, it could be that they hear something and they think you said it, or like what you said, saw something and they think that it was you, but it's more likely that what they, I don't know, I, you know, when I had BP, I never had a psychotic break. Um, but a psychotic break is more that they're losing track of everything to do with reality. So could it be that? It could be. But more to the point, they would probably be in such a confused state. Hard to say, really. But yeah, some people with BPD do have psychotic breaks. Um, so now, you know... The stinking APA with their pseudosciences, all pseudosciences also diagnosing borderline personality disorder, subtype schizophrenia, like the very things that people worked so hard to delineate in the 1950s and 60s, in the 2010 to now region, they're trying to fuse them back. Of course, they have an agenda, and it doesn't make any sense. Um, Jonathan, the emotional flood for them is really real. Yeah, it is. It's the past and here and now. I happen to know that from the inside out, ladies and gentlemen. That's not up for dispute. Um, Deborah, my ex was the same. She thought she could read people's minds. Well, yeah, I don't know why they think that. Because they can't, they don't even know their own minds. They don't even know what's going on for them. Yeah, it is frustrating, Jonathan, for sure. And Steffi said, I could tell it was real for him. It was sadly real for him and for me. Hmm. Well, anything that goes within BPD is ter in terms of parano paranoid ideation has usually the word transient in front of it. So, um, like psychotic breaks as well, transient. Otherwise, they might have something else comorbid. So again, they're not all the same. But, um, and actually, I don't know about paranoid ideation because if it's a psychotic break, it's a psychotic break. And that's not ideation. But anyway. Shadow Moses. Um, but if we validate them, wouldn't that be abandoning us too? It's like a double bind. Damned if we do, damned if we didn't. 
Well, yeah. I mean, re- the relational impossibility of BPD is the quintessential ever-existing double bind. But um, I think what people mean by that, or pe- people that have written books that suggest this, they mean to just try to validate them when you can. Like, that would be, I guess, when things aren't totally, like, you know, like the, like when things are still low level, but like problematic, so, you know, like maybe like I hear you, um, I hear that you're, well, if you say I hear you're really upset, you might get like, you might get it right there, but, but it is a double bind. But certain books and certain treatment centers in the U.S. on their websites love to put this out there, that if you just do this, it'll help, you know, help the borderline, help the borderline. Well, good luck with it. It doesn't work. I mean, if they're in significant and successful treatment that's going, then it might make a difference somewhere down the road, but otherwise it doesn't work. Well, with or without paranoid ideation or blatant mistrust or a psychotic break or a triggered response of any kind, you're often going to be held responsible and accused of something that you didn't do or say. Uh, Deborah Wheels doesn't have as much control over their own destiny as you would think. So not everybody is in the same situation. Uh... Yeah, hoker, hoker, family of origin issues, my stuff. Yeah, that's no fun for anybody, for sure. Wheels has a narc parent, and is handicapped and can't get out. So, Wheels has been working really hard on codependency. Wheels is still being narcissistically abused. So you have to realize not everybody can just get up and walk away. Not everybody can just leave. And so that's what's happening with wheels. And I don't want you to have to defend yourself, wheels. Uh, Jonathan, eight years. Jonathan M. Eight years with uh, undiagnosed BPD. So many red flags are ignored. It's sad, but fog lifts slowly. Nine months later, working to get a point where, to a point where it's in the past, Stay no contact and focus on, on self. Videos and sessions help. Yes, definitely. Well said. Um, Steffi, yes, it's a catch-22. I couldn't betray myself by admitting I did something I didn't do. Well, yeah, and then it just exploded into a, a foobar mess, you said. But, like, the thing is that, that you're not responsible for how they react. I mean, it's not pleasant to be around. And they can get more abusive, and that's not okay. But the thing is, you can't, it never should anybody admit to something that they didn't do. You have to always stand your ground and be in your own reality. Well, people with BPD deflect a tremendous amount, too. Obviously, like what Jonathan said, it's to cover the tracks and to escape any accountability and personal responsibility. Whether they actually know what they're up to or not, it, you know, because it's not the same for every single person with BPD. Um, Jonathan realized codependency and need to focus on self. I knew X was BPD. I didn't know what codependency was. I do now. And, well, good that you're focused on getting better. That's excellent. Um, Trev, it's common uh, for my partner to, is it common for my partner to idolize um, their parents, even though one or both may be responsible for their trauma? Yeah, they still have them in the idealization category because of enmeshment and codependence, even with BPD, and the fact that they, they're still trying to seek through others and or the parents what they never got. And that's something that is very difficult for people with BPD to break away from 
you know, to get out of the collusion with the, with the family of origin, with the dysfunctional family system, and to finally realize that they're not going to get what they've sought from those parents and get into treatment and, you know, do part of, you know, learn about the grieving process there as well as how to heal. Yeah, well said, Steffi. Um, yeah, very true, Jonathan M., that tell yourself there's nothing you could do. It's not about you. So true, and yet that, that takes people quite a while to realize, you know, um, in the beginning when these relationships just end and, you know, the, the pain's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people do think that they can love them out of it, and but they don't even receive the love, yeah. Um, Shadow Moses, good thought, AJ, same thoughts exactly. Honesty is so good when it's early, not probably when it's super chaotic and bad. Yeah, well, because then there's nothing anybody can really do. Um, Deborah, before my relationship with my ex BPD, I knew very little about psychology. Now I'm really interested in it, thinking about studying it. Anyone else the same? I've been there, done that, got the t shirt. Um, but I know you're not asking me. Um, Yeah, it's nice support of wheels there, Shadow Moses. Oh, you're welcome, Steffi, and um, I'm glad the live streams are helpful. Um, Mikhail, my BPX just texted me. And she still thinks I'm to blame for everything. I'm the nice guy type. I've been nice for way too long. I'm tempted to text her that I've had enough of her gaslighting. Shit. Well, yeah. You can either do that or you can just decide you really had enough and just block her and start to move on. Hey there, JT. Mikhail, but I'm afraid I'll... Be sucked into a new intolerable argument. Well, yeah, it kind of makes a good case for the don't reply, block, and leave the relationship. Which you don't even have to tell her about, actually, because you just get punished for that, too. Well, the thing is, you know, once you really do your own healing recovery work, which is so important after these relationships is uh, for what Jonathan is saying there about a lot of cluster Bs and narcissists um, in life because of working in entertainment, because, you know, they are in every walk of life and we do need to recognize them and we do need to be able to take care of ourselves going forward with the reality that, you know, they're they're everywhere. I mean, there's at least a couple of them, like in every group of people, statistically speaking, these days. No, yeah, there's a there's a lot to attachment theory, and people with codependency um, would would benefit from understanding that more about yourselves too. You know, just saying. Um, Object relations uh, theory is the best thing that explains cluster B, in my opinion. Um, Steffi, Mikkel, that's the thing that pains me the most, is when they accuse you of being, quote, the bad guy, unquote. Uh, they seem to be the only one who thinks that, because it's not true. Um, because they're painting you into the, uh, you know, object other bad parent. So it's definitely not about you at all, but 
Wheels, um, thank you for that, AJ. Um, thanks for your support, too, Shadow Moses. Oh, you're welcome, Wheels. Um, Mikhail, yeah, you're right. I'll get punished for that, too. I'm just so angry. But I'll take it up with my therapist. Yeah, and I hope your therapist really understands BPD because you're in that, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't place. And better to err on the side of starting to take care of yourself and, you know, end the relationship. Jonathan M. AJ, great video recently about how it's hard to recover from BPD relationship and codependency in uncertain times. There are less distractions, jobs, um, jobs change Harder to see family and friends' thoughts. Well, yeah, I mean, I hear from at least one or two clients every day that, you know, the many, the, the, the various different ways it's really affecting them. And it is increasing pain. And even with clients I work with, it's, it's caused a few to want to go back around the cycle again. And, and a couple have already been there, done that, because it really only takes a week or two to get you know, kind of like trying to get back when, when it's a reverse Hoover situation and then getting sort of, you know, chewed up and spit out again. But unfortunately, I think for a lot of people out of relationships with somebody with BPD or even a narcissist, they're, they're, they're right now, like they can be in so much pain with the uncertainty, so much anxiety with what's going on that they basically start to think, you know, slippery slope of thought that it might be better to go back to that person if, if you know, in a reverse Hoover situation than to be alone. And that is the struggle of codependency is that you need to learn to be alone. And not everybody with codependency has the same struggle with being alone, but you need to be able to be in that relationship, make, make it healthier um, to and with yourself so that you won't slide. Because nowadays, I mean, with everything that's going on, I think the one thing that, the only one positive I can take out of it, really, and largely for a lot of clients, and when I'm thinking about it, if I make a video on a subject like that, is there, there's never been a more important time, let alone people having more time in, in life ever, that people need to understand themselves, know themselves, and have a really kind and gentle, healthy relationship to and with self which people with codependency don't have until they keep on working on their healing and recovery. So, you know, in an uncertain world, everything is more difficult for everybody. And definitely when people just come out of these relationships, or even if it's been a little while, when all of the other normal routine, healthy and and good routine that you might have in your life starts falling by the wayside because of the world situation, then people can, you know, it's, it's, it's stressful and many people aren't equipped until they heal the codependency to deal with that. So I think, you know, not, not being able to see front. Yeah. I mean, what's going on with this whole thing is one thing. And then what's behind it in the, in the idea and reality that, you know, has anybody ever thought about the fact that the situation that's going on, um, among other things, is really trying to break people down. Because if you don't know yourself and you don't know how to be with yourself and you're, you know, really hurting after one of these relationships, it's it's just going to be exponentially more stressful and more painful. So I think my message to people, given that we don't know what's going on or what's going to happen next out there, is take it upon yourself to take this time now and really work on yourself and really put in an effort to be able to, if you are struggling with being with yourself, to, to really create that relationship healthier to yourself and with yourself so that you could enjoy some solitude and find some peace, not that it still isn't stressful for people. Um, yeah, well, I think I think most online dating stuff is a wash with with BPD and NPD types. And um, I definitely, like, I don't know. I mean, I'm in a nice, I'm in a great relationship, but if I wasn't, uh, I'd be fine with that too. And I certainly would not be, uh, I've never used a dating app or anything. Um,
And it's so definitely interesting how we find ourselves surrounded by these people. And it's led us to an interest in psychology. Yes, it would be good to understand ourselves better, too. Well, and I would say start with the understanding of self first. And then whatever else you want to understand in psychology or study it, great. But you should definitely come first, each and every one of you. And, um, oh, shoot. Oh, I did hit that button. Okay. A <laughs> um, little bit of lag time there. And, well, um, well, yeah, but you see, the more decent and nice to you, to, to her you are, unfortunately, she doesn't trust that. She doesn't know what to do with that. She, she will uh, react um, terribly to that. And then what are you going to do, right? Because, I mean, you're a nice, decent person, and they just, they can't take that in. Like, they don't take in love either, and they actually punish people for being kind and nice to them. Even though you think that that's what they want, but they can't trust it. And the reason they can't trust it is within them. It's nothing to do with, like, you, Mikhail, in this case, or anyone else. Um, Ian, be honest with yourself and others. Don't people please, don't suppress, express. Yes. And what ends up happening for people with codependency with, with somebody with BPD? It's, it's like totally suppressing and not expressing. And then if you do try to express how you feel, of course, they can't deal with it. They don't want to hear that because, oh my God, it's got to be all about them. Which is really um, a childlike response, but still, it's not tenable. Um, yeah, I think that's really true, Jonathan, that people do attract, um, more often subconsciously, but people that they need to learn from. And, um, Mikhail to Jonathan, right, no contact. They've resisted the urge for 20 days now. Well, you know, you keep, keep resisting it, get into some therapy and healing for yourself and, and just keep you know, one day at a time, add into those days, and it will gradually get a little bit easier. I'm just reading. And I chose that having been rejected by my partner, should I show her compassion? Or should, will she just see this as a weakness? I also want to thank you for giving um, your, up your time. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I think the best thing is, you know, since you've been rejected by your partner, is to take care of yourself, go full no contact. And if you have feelings of compassion toward her, that's great, but to show her that compassion is only going to get you more rejected and more abuse, to tell you the truth. Um, that's really true, true, Ian, what you said to Shadow Moses, except they're not just habits. It's deeper than a habit. Well, you know, what people are, what, what Treb said and what people are saying is weakness isn't a weakness because vulnerability is a strength and it's your strength, but yeah, you're going to get abused for it. So, you know, that is not helpful, but that's because people with BPD are so unaware of what a weakened condition they're in emotionally and they do use it against people, but it's not weakness in healthier people, though. It's vulnerability is a strength, but no, you shouldn't really show that to an untreated borderline. Yeah, the double bind is always there, Shadow Moses. Well, they get angry when people are sick or need them the most, absolutely, and... 
There is no excuse for it. But when they get stressed, they get triggered and they won't be there for you the way that you likely have been there for them. Well, yeah, Jonathan M., what they do is, is you know, they ghost or discard or whatever word you want to use, um, but it all goes back to how it's a repetition compulsion, to what they don't understand emotionally, to what they need to work on to heal or it will never change, and then they do go to a random stranger and they start all over again. Um Yeah, and one could say habits equals programming, pre-programming from childhood, but they're not habits, they're deeper, they're wounds, they're negative core beliefs. So habits is, you know, I understand what you mean, but it doesn't really encapsulate what the deeper reality of that really is, and then more to the point, how one begins to heal and change from that. You said the subconscious autopilot we go to. Yes, yeah, very true. Or consciously make decisions to change, yes, slowly steering the ship in a new direction, right, which has a lot to do with reframing and healing the, uh, changing and healing the narrative of the negative core beliefs from childhood and getting out of the role from the family of origin and self-differentiating. Um, Empath Uprising, I'm healing still, and a lot of it because of you, would love to do a collaboration. Oh, cool. Well, we'll have to do that sometime for sure, and I'll, I'll be in touch. Or you can email me if you feel like it at hmhari.ca, but um, I didn't realize that you're still healing, but that makes sense, and I just didn't know where you were on your journey. And and, and if I'm being helpful, I'm really happy, you know, glad to be helpful. Um, Mikkel, my BPD always came up with that. I hated her when I tried to set boundaries with her. I spent so much energy refuting that. At some point, it gave up. Well, believe me, it's healthy to give up because, you know, it's that rock in a hard place and they'll win again that, um, you know, they that they feel or somehow misconstrue your needs and your boundaries as hating them. But that isn't, you know, ensconced that that's an expression of fear of abandonment, right? Which, but still, can't. You can't be them for them, and that's essentially what they're needing, and nobody can be them for them. That's why they need to go to treatment, figure out who they are, find themselves, and deal with all their woundedness and trauma. Shadow Moses, AJ, in my culture, vulnerability is looked down, especially with men. Well, yeah, but uh, and my message especially goes to men, that vulnerability is a strength, whether a man or a woman. Um, so you're welcome. And vulnerability is part of strength. Yes, it is. Because it can't always be strong all the time. Well, and that's something that I think culture wants men to walk around believing, that they're supposed to be strong all the time, when you're human too. And men cry, and men need to cry, and men need to feel. And, and you know, you said I have limits too, can't get hurt, but um, can get hurt, can cry. Well, and that's important because that's healthy, Right. And I know that a lot of culture goes against that, um, different cultures, but goes against men often, you know, that whole idea of just suck it up, be a man. Well, what does that mean? Because that's, I think, toxic femininity in action right there. And when a, when, when a mother says to a little boy, suck it, like, suck it up, be a man. What, what, what's that mean when you're five years old, for crying out loud, let alone however old you are now? Like men need to acknowledge their hurt and their vulnerability because it's not a weakness. It's a strength. But I think men have really been taught that to be vulnerable or to feel or to express feelings is not a, quote, manly, unquote, thing to do. It's not a gender-specific thing. It's, it's about being human. But men don't get shown that it's okay very much in their lives, some or some men not at all. Um, mm 
Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that, Wheels, because you're dealing with so much and you're doing the best you can. And, and you know, elongated narcissistic abuse, and I realize you're stuck. But, um, again, I really hope you can find a way out of there because that's, as you know, really probably the only way you're going to ever get free of it. Because cause with that, there's no being free in the same space, you know, so to speak. Um, Ian, negative core beliefs. Yeah, habits is way too light of a word. Well, I think it's important to call these things what they are because people need to know that, you know, like a bad habit is, I don't I can't even think of one right now, but somebody might say smoking is a bad habit, but I think it's more than a bad habit. But, you know, because it could be a form of self-harm, you know, or self-sabotage or not caring about oneself that might really be affected by deeper negative core beliefs. And those are the things that not only wound the inner child, but they also, you know, form the inner critic narrative, which is the injunction taking on for, taken on from an abusive parent. So it's sort of like, in one way or another, not always the same, a parent has impacted you as a child, at least at some point, if not ongoing, um, as much as a borderline is going to impact you. Now, you know, because because they're undermining your sense of self, which isn't a hundred percent secure in people with codependency to start with, which they may not know until they encounter all of this. Uh, Shadow Moses, so it's forced to internalize and keep to myself. I kept a lot of anger in my childhood and a lot of physical hurt, but I'm more expressive now in my adulthood, which helped with anger management. Yeah, because you know, anger is a very healthy emotion. Often, though, what's under anger or rage is, you know, pain, grief, and loss. So really important to get to those feelings really helps take the charge out of the protective aspect of the emotion of anger. Um, Alchemic Truth. Um, I like that her advice is realistic and not giving false hope. It's tough dealing with someone with uh, BPD. Oh, you're welcome. I guess that her would be me. <laughs> um, Empath Uprising. I am super grateful for you, AJ. It's all the way back in 2011 that I went through my borderline codependent nightmare. Wow. And and I hear you. Well, I'm just, I'm so glad when I can be helpful to people. And the other thing is that, you know, and I, and I want to say this with the utmost respect, right? And the reality that you're still healing, like it's, what these people do, and they're not all the same, but what, what a lot of people with BPD do to people, I mean, it takes years to heal from it, and it's inconscionable. And, like, I am not at all a BPD apologist, and I I think BPD abuse is horrific. And, you know, there's no excuse for it either. So I just want to make that clear. And... um And Shadow Moses, internalized anger can lead to physical outlet. Well, I mean, besides feeling your feelings, which is important, what a lot of people can do with internalized anger, it's important to, like, physical exercise is a good outlet. But if somebody internalizes anger too much, it can lead to a reactionary sort of outburst of it, which wouldn't be the healthiest physical outlet. So, And I'm not saying you said that because I really don't know what you're referring to specifically. Maybe that, maybe not. Ian, right, it takes so much more strength to love someone and allow yourself to be vulnerable. Absolutely. It's it's something that people with BPD don't have the strength of at all because I don't like to say they're broken because they're not broken beyond repair, but they have lost a cell. And so there's a lot they're missing there. And you said, I feel for all those people, especially men who don't believe this. Well, yeah, because, you know, loving, let alone the impossibility of loving a borderline, but loving is, is always, you know, the degree to which we can trust others is the degree to which we trust ourselves. So therein I've just explained why borderlines don't trust at all, because they have no self at, to trust, you know, they don't know themselves. And again, I'm not making apologies for them, just explain it. So it does take a lot of strength and vulnerability to love someone else. And that usually can be, you know, um, 
a positive experience when it's a healthier person who can mutually and reciprocally return that to you, right? And share that vulnerability with you, which of course people with BPD can't do. And they're very vulnerable people, but they're always fighting that, right? And defending against that. Alchemic Truth, how long did it take you to recover or, quote, get over that situation? Empath- oh, to empath rising. And um, Jonathan M., when you go no contact, they can get out your family and friends. Hasn't happened yet, but could. Is there a way to respond? I've prepared, quote, please don't contact me. I hope you get some help, unquote. Um, well, the please don't contact me, you might want to think about putting it into words like um, maybe please don't contact me. Any further contact would be unwanted contact. And, and then um, I hope you get some help. Because you need to lay the foundation down that any more contacted contact is unwanted. And if you send that in a text, you keep a copy of that. And if anybody with BPD or NPD or anything for that matter starts to contact family or friends, call the police immediately because that is the beginning of criminal harassment and stalking. They don't have the right to contact anybody in your world, family, or your friends. And when they do that, you need to document that and call the police right away and then work on getting a restraining order And then anytime they contact anybody that's related to you or that's been a friend of yours, uh, then they're going to violate that restraining order once you get it. And then they'll be put in jail because not everybody with BPD is the same, but some will stalk, will harass, will smear with family and friends, and they can't stop and they necessarily won't be able to stop until you use the law and the police to stop them. And they're not all like that, but some are. Um, uh, Mikhail. Oh, okay, I'll share another thing. I felt more in love with her than I've ever experienced before. When she flipped, it hurt so incredibly much, so much that I cried for the first time in years. Well, I really feel for you, and I'm really sorry to hear that that's, you know, what happened. I mean, that whole experience, because you felt more love with her than anything you'd experienced before that's a positive but then of course she flips and you realize she's not really who you you fell in love with and then it's a world of hurt and the only good news in that is that as you heal and recover from that just know that you will learn the next time to put to to not give that love until you know it's somebody that's worthy of it as somebody who's going to reciprocate it. So it's the positive in that negative experience is that you really have stretched and learned more about your capacity to love. And unfortunately that it was with a borderline, but as these painful, painful experiences are crises for people, they're also the biggest growth opportunity you could ever ask for. And people don't know how to hear that at first, But as you continue healing and recovering, you'll come to know that. And then it it becomes a silver lining in an otherwise horrible experience. Whoops. um, Not a friendly scroll bar. What else is new? Um. Shadow Moses, I'm I'm only son on an all girl family, so you get it. Well, yes, culture, yes, and you know I just want to make it clear here. I can't, you know, anticipate what every troll and, and goofy person out there is going to say, but I'm um, not saying you know just some people are goofy that way. Uh, I'm not you know trying to say that boys should be raised like girls, but the boys need to be taught a lot more. And, and men, maybe right now, need to learn a lot more about how it's okay to feel and how it's okay to be a human being. And that this idea of, you know, holding all your feelings in all the time and just being stoic isn't healthy. So I just want to make the point, I'm not suggesting that boys be raised like girls, but boys need a little something different than they've been getting for centuries. Um, 
Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, Chad Moses, because that that's only going to intensify the effect of of the females in your family. And, you know, er, every boy needs a dad, and I'm so sorry that your dad passed away and you didn't get to meet him. Um, Mikhail, uh, oh, yes, relating to Jonathan. Hey there, Albert. Um, can BPD be nice, good people? Um... It's not that they're not nice people, believe it or not, but they're so wounded, so traumatized, and they don't know themselves. So it's not that they're, I wouldn't say that they're bad people, but they can behave abhorrently. But if they get into treatment and healing and recovery, then they can really consolidate and find out who they really are and do a lot of healing and become a nicer person for sure. Because it's it's this um, defensive presentation that is anything but nice. And you said, do they have multiple personality? No, they don't. They absolutely don't. They don't. They don't. It's exceedingly rare. It's not a differential diagnosis with BPD. And people that board otherwise are just pulling your leg or something. Um, Trev, can you tell or is there any clue that some of BPD is aware of their actions? Well, I think when it's when that person that you're with or you were with, you get to know them, you see their pattern more. Maybe sometimes you can, maybe sometimes you can't, because the truth is it varies greatly across people with BPD, even untreated, um, whether or not they actually consciously, in, in an on-purpose way, are doing what they're doing, um, like if they're really aware or not, because more often than not, they're not aware of a lot. But that doesn't mean that at some point, especially you got to remember they're watching videos too uh, of other people with BPD at the very least, that they might not learn a little bit more about what they're actually doing. So it, it that's the thing that's really hard to say in any global kind of way about people with BPD because some will be unaware more than you could ever think and some will be a little bit more aware, and some at some points in, in manipulation and punishment may well exactly know what they're doing. So it's it's got a high variance across people with BPD. Down the rabbit hole, do they triangulate their children against each other and triangulate the children against other people to make the BPD look good? Well, um, I don't know if they, it's to make the BPD look good, but Usually in these families of origin, depending what the parents are like, uh, for people that get diagnosed with BPD, um, I, I know in my experience, like with, with a BPD and PD mother and a dark triad father, both cluster B and both narcissists, and uh, they definitely triangulated, um, you know, their kids, me being, uh, one, you know, the scapegoat one. Um, but I, I don't think it, it depends, you know, like if it's a really extremely codependent person with a child with BPD trying to make them look good or a narcissist that's image conscious, but still it's hard to say. I think most of the triangulation that happens in these families is not really to try to make the BPD look good. Although they might pull that kind of stuff if, if you're falling in love with somebody with BPD and they know the family knows that there's issues there, but they might want to just make them look good so you won't catch on kind of thing. Um, well, Deborah, what you're describing down the rabbit hole there is, yeah, the unfortunate, um, you know, splitting. I mean, a borderline, untreated, I take it, who has two children, and one can do no wrong, the golden child, and one can do no right, the scapegoat. Um, yeah, that that was what I went through as a kid, too, because the golden child could do no wrong, and I could do no right, period. And uh, never mind what he was really up to and what he was guilty of. They didn't give a crap. But what I never even did, I got punished for more than he got even reprimand or consequence for anything he did. And um, so that's not exactly triangulation, though, but it is, um, it is divide and conquer is what it is. Um, Ian, I want to break up. I want to be friends. Ooh. And, there, and therefore, 
her, her know that it won't work. So advice to communicate with her, no contact, etc. Well, I would, I would refer you, like just do a Google search, um, you know, AJ Mahari, can you be friends with your ex? It was a live stream I did a while back. It's on the channel here somewhere. Um, it's not a good idea to think that you can break up with them and then be friends because that's, how's that going to work? Doesn't work. And, um, he said, I want to be friends and let her know that, let her know that the relationship won't work. Um, well, I think you're best off just going no contact and taking care of yourself because I hate to say it, but an untreated borderline that, that, you know, hurts you in a relationship and you can't get any communication and, you know, they can't take any responsibility. Um, and to want a friend like that, you know, who needs an enemy, so to speak. Um, Empath Uprising to alchem Alchemic Truth. Um, it took nearly five years to get over it. The borderline wasn't the real problem. My extreme toxic codependency was. Yeah, that's, that's really what is the longer part of the healing. Which is unfortunate, but um, very true in most people's cases. Um, you know, from the woundedness of, of one's own childhood and, and, and having codependency. Uh, Shadow Moses, thank you um, uh, for understanding AJ. Oh, you're welcome. Deborah, AJ, I noticed my ex had three, quote, personalities, unquote. A sweet four-year-old, an evil teenager, and a paranoid adult. Is this typical in BPD? Well, they're not separate personalities. They're just different presentations. And probably the sweet four-year-old is an aspect of a remnant of a fragment of the, the you know, BPD is a, the, the injury and the woundedness there in young childhood is a fragmentation off of the child ego state. So they're fragmented in that regard, but that's not the same as having person, different personalities. So the four-year-old is probably a remnant of that really wounded child and pretty authentic. The evil teenager and the paranoid adult are different presentations of ages and stages of what now is predominantly a false self. So typical, yes, but to be referred to as alters of personalities, and I know you put that in quotes, is the erroneous part. I'm not saying on your part, but on so many people out there that want to try to fuse more stuff together, including the APA, of course. Um, alchemic truth. Oh, yeah, I hear that. The codependency is, is, the hard to is hard to let go of. Well, you can't just let go of it. You have to actually heal your way through it. And I think a lot of people, when they realize they have codependency, and a lot of people fight that idea for a long time, but when they realize they have codependency, they, they then minimize it. I don't understand just how deep a wound that really is because codependency, like I've recovered from BPD and codependency. And seriously, when I really think back to it, codependency took a lot longer, number one. And number two, the pain of each process, sure, recovery from BPD was the most painful, but not by as long a margin or as wide a margin as one might think because codependency is a formidable woundedness in and of itself. And then even more so after you've been in a relationship with a borderline or a narcissist. Because um, there's more to heal there. And it seems almost impossible for me to get over that. Well, I would say, you know, work with someone who really understands this area, right? Of not only that, you know, you had a relationship with a borderline and that you have codependency and you have to look back into your childhood, etc. But, um, People really can't do it on their own, you know, and books and videos are great, but they're not going to help you to get to the healing and recovery that you really need to do. That's within the emotional landscape and doesn't matter how much you know, in, you know, intellectually, it's not going to automatically change how you feel and those negative core beliefs that you're carrying around. Well, that's interesting, blog watcher. My BPD, I don't know what that means, but okay. Um, C. Todd, uh, in your experience, what's the most common comorbidity for someone with BPD? 
Well, first you have to believe in all the nonsense of the pseudoscience of, you know, the APA. But um, in my experience, well, I don't believe that everything is so comorbid. Like, you know, anxiety, depression. When I had BPD way back in the dark ages before they started doing all the nonsense they're doing with it now, I just figured the depression, I had low-grade depression, and the anxiety was as part of BPD. But anyway, um... The most common comorbidity. It's probably uh, BPD NPD or BPD with at least four narcissistic traits is the most common in my experience. Uh, but I'm also going to put out there that common also in my experience in working with clients over the years. I'll say very vaguely. Um, and I'm not talking about any client specifically. Um, is people with codependency who've been hurt by somebody with BPD, and they themselves have codependency, yes, but they're also vulnerable narcissists. So that gets into some tricky work. But um, so codependency isn't comorbid with vulnerable narcissism in that regard. But let's just hope that the APA keeps their paws off codependency because there's already one YouTuber out there, everybody knows who it is, that's already pathologizing it. Like what we need is more solutions more human context experience, I believe, in a, what I, what I practice with my clients is a humanistic psychology approach. So we need less pathologizing of humanity, not more. Um, Albert, um, AJ, great work helping people learn. Well, thank you. Empath uprising to alchemic, alchemic truth. If I could do it, anyone, if I could do it, anyone can. The recovery blueprint is on my channel, although you are in great hands here. AJ is one um, of two people who helped me smarten up and heal. Oh, cool. Well, I'd like to find out more about what that blueprint is that you have there. Empath Uprising sounds really interesting. Um, and down the rabbit hole. Question why do... What, oh, question, sorry. Um, why? I need a colon there. Otherwise, I'm going to read it like a sentence. Oh, it's okay. Why do um, why do they triangulate people against each other? What is the reason? Um, well, people with BPD don't do it as much as narcissists, but it's it's because for narcissists, the triangulation it's all about supply. It's all about creating chaos, and it's that sadistic quality of enjoying other people's pain. So if they can provoke it and 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 orchestrate it, then they, they enjoy it even more. So it doesn't have any reason that makes any sense to the rest of us. It's really sick behavior. Um, Jonathan M., good question about being a nice person. Loving and generous to significant other and family, but then disappears. Like AJ said in a video, happy together one day, but down and leaves the next, repeats. Yeah, because, because when they get happy, if they get the happiness ever, it scares the living shit out of them, just to put it in the vernacular, and they have to get away. And the closer you get, and the better it is, the more likely, if they're a ghoster, and they're not all the same, but you're definitely going to get a fight, cre they're going to create a fight, or they're going to ghost, or they're going to distance for days, however they do that, which might be mini-ghosting, I don't know. But, um... Because they just can't trust, you know, they just can't trust it. And and then it goes away. And then, you know, they split to the value as defense against what they don't know what to do with what's happening that's so good when they can't trust it. And, yes, the cycle just repeats ad infinitum if they don't get treatment. Um, Well, you know, people feeling like there's at least three or four personalities in a person with BPD, you're seeing a different manifestation of a fragmented individual, yes, but not, not to the level of DID. But you're seeing different presentations, different age, stage presentations, and or different aspects of the false self presentation, but they are not separate personalities. Um, and we can't call them self-states in an untreated borderline because they don't have a self in which to have different states of self, though essentially it could be called that, but it's a misnomer because 
I don't know how many more times I can say on this channel, but people don't seem to be ingesting the reality of the arrested self, the psychologically killed, otherwise psychologically killed, otherwise burgeoning authentic self. It evacuates, and you're dealing with a false self with remnants and fragments only, but not fragments as in alters of different personalities of the person with BPD. So be careful what you listen to out there, and you can believe whatever you want, but if you want what's going to be most helpful for, to, to you, I really believe it's not to be trying to say they have these different personalities. They have different presentations and manifestations of different feelings and, and things of that nature, but no more, no less. Um, and, and a lot of people are putting out so much information about that now, and I don't know why. Like, what do they get out of it? Supply, I guess. Um, Ian, biggest lesson learned, acceptance. We can't change others. The most you can do is tell the horse there is a river. Yes, well said. Uh, we, uh, Will, sorry, AJ, I always got blamed for um, golden child younger brother's bad habits. Anything bad he did, he learned from me. Yeah, I know. It's, it's just such bullshit from narcissists. Oh, thanks for that reference, Wheels. There's a link to what I was saying about can you be friends with your ex with BPD. And it was an interesting live stream, um, I think. I think it could be helpful to people who are wondering that. Um, Trev, my son is only just, sorry, my son is only young just yet. However, what signs of possible problems should I watch out for um, should I look out for, geez, I can read, um, in his upbringing, I'm worried about his emotional welfare. Well, and as you should be, really, unfortunately, it's, it's yes, goes with the territory. Um, so, um, while he's really young, you know, don't you, you need to, if you can, I don't know if you know any, whether or not she's been able to be attuned or, you know, mirroring him appropriately, because often they don't. So there's that, but then he might have enough resilience to withstand that. And then if he can be with you more too, you're going to be a stabilizing factor to what he experiences from his mother. But key things are to watch if, like, if he's still an infant, it's, like, within reason. And if there's, you know, a physical, if he's checked out physically and it's not colic, etc. If there's a lot of excessive crying, something's going wrong. If he's one or two... Uh, you need to really be watching for, you know, because, you know, the terrible twos, but does anything look extreme? Is he too easily frustrated, even for a young age, or if he's three or four? You know, how is he getting along with other people? Does he look like he's, quote, over-attached to his mother? Um, I think I had a client recently say that they're, you know, they thought that the BPD mother, their, that their ex was over attached to the child and that was a good thing no 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 it isn't it's going to smother the child and interfere with separation individuation potentially so what you want to watch for is a child that seems relatively happy that isn't too easily frustrated that is having age appropriate behavior and what i would recommend trev and i do recommend to my clients is, you know, familiarize yourself with the eight, well, Eric, Eric Erickson is one, or Jean Piaget is another, um, the, the early childhood stages of development. So you can already know, and from their work, you know, you can just Google it, then you'll really learn exactly what to look for. But I'm just talking about the basic things. And I mean, they'll also be reiterating, that, you know, their work will not reiterate me, I'm reiterating them. But but I, I think anybody who's co-parenting or in a co-parenting situation, even if it doesn't work, with especially men with a woman with BPD who's the mother, you really need to familiarize yourself with those early stages of childhood development so you can really watch this for yourself. Because what's key about it is when you see any problems arising, even if they're like two, three, heading to four years old, you want to get them to a child psychologist as fast as you can because there are a lot of specialists out there who work with children in these circumstances who can really, even if they're headed toward maybe likely a BPD diagnosis from the first two years of life, they can really, um, I, I know some people who are doing this work now, they can really make a difference. 
And so that's that's what you want to be really attuned to as much as you can be, because I know there's a lot of men who aren't seeing very much of what's going on with the parenting between the mother and the child. But if they're untreated with BPD, it's going to be problematic. And then the, and the question is just to what degree and how is it going to affect the child? And, and, and unless you can spend more time with them to balance that out, the other thing is when they're really young is when everything matters the most. So, you know, you need to make sure that you do whatever you have to do to be around your son a lot. And that might mean being around him with her. But again, in that co-parenting situation, the focus has got to always be on the child. And otherwise, you're not talking to the ex about anything but the child. But fathers really need to, and, and you might have to fight in the legal system, but you need to be there. The younger they are, the more important it is that you know what's going on and how it's affecting them. Uh, Minish, it's, is it normal for someone with PPD to have overconfidence? Well, not all the time, but they can feel like they're less than and feel very unworthy. And then all of a sudden get this sort of sense of entitlement or feeling, um, where'd your comment just go? Um, or feeling overconfident because overconfident with people with BPD is definitely an overcompensatory strategy. It's a lie, essentially. It's not really who they are. So overconfidence in somebody with BPD is usually like, what's up with that? Something's going on. Um, uh, Lou, are many of these terms healthy and balanced short doses? Are, are they healthy or balanced in short doses? Seems to me a disorder comes about when the pendulum never swings back to the other direction. There's no balance in the force, so to speak. Um, yeah, but if something is intensely, so you're saying these terms, okay? So what I talk about here in this channel, if there is some intense presentation, even in short doses, um, then that's not healthy. Because if, if it's ongoing, even in short doses, then it, it could still well be a disorder because that intensity and the frequency, and for some people with BPD, it can be short doses of that. Because like I said, there's so many different presentations. And it's, it's when there, so there's a lack of balance if somebody is going, even in short doses, to this real intensity extreme or black and white kind of thinking and behaving, even in short doses, it, it's not healthy because it, it by its very nature doesn't have a balance. Uh, Shadow Moses, my respect and empathy to people with BPD, they come with codependency too, then it doubles their healing work journey. Yeah, it definitely does. And like myself and so many, uh, sexual abuse, you have to do the sexual abuse recovery. It's a lot of moving pieces, and uh, you know, and some people don't care, and some people have compassion, but the people with BPD are in unbelievable worlds of hurt, and it is from that that they damage others. But then that becomes abuse, and there's no excuse for abuse. So that's in full acknowledgement of it all. Um, yeah, that is why years and years of recovery, and plus. What happens in those early developmental stages, you know, like, and when the arrested emotional development occurs, which a lot of people don't, and a lot of modalities and a lot of the rhetoric of the APA doesn't look at, doesn't, you know, take the context into account. Um, that's why it takes years and years to recover, absolutely, because of very, very deep woundedness. And, um, whoops. I just hit the thing once, and it goes way past things. Um, down the rabbit hole, if, if that's directed at me, um, you're very welcome. Shadow Moses um, also counts the comorbidity, or if they stay committed. Um, comorbidity can't really, I don't know. Sometimes you'd think it would be based on a certain kind of trauma, but it's hard to say, you know, because I don't think that, comorbidity, who, who's comorbid, who isn't, with this, that, or the other thing, I, I don't know how that gets explained, you know, and simply from my own lived experience, I mean, 
I'm not saying I had it as worse as anyone or the worst, but for all the abuse I went through and the trauma that I, you know, was traumatized, totally traumatizing childhood, the whole thing, um, and beyond, um, because they never changed. Um, but then, you know, I did the work and poop on them, who cares? Um, but it's like, it's, it's really hard to say that, um, cause you know, I, I was extremely lucky then, right? Cause I mean, I was atypical for BPD anyways, which I've been saying for years. So we'll leave it at that and the trauma and what that means. And, um, and of course I refused all psych meds, which helped. And I just was a person who learned tough stuff out until I could get to help to help me figure it out. So I think... Uh, The comorbidity in terms of recovery, um, if it's BPD, NPD comorbidity, it seriously makes the recovery process a lot more complicated. But I have worked with some some clients over the years with with that exact comorbidity that have healed and recovered. Because it is doable, but it's really hellfire for them to go through and hard for them to stay committed. Mikhail, um, is it common to feel trapped in the relationship? I felt like that. I became increasingly increasingly desperate to get out, but I felt I couldn't. Well, yes, and, and I like the way you phrased the question because it is common to feel trapped. And for the reasons you mentioned, like, you know, you, you wanted to get out, but you didn't know how to get out. But so essentially, you know, what, what I want to acknowledge here is that you phrased your question in a non-victim way, which I think is really important because some people think that it's the borderline that traps you there, and that's not true. It's everything about it, the trauma bond, the cognitive dissonance, the chemical soup, and what it's replicating in some way to the wounded inner child that people aren't consciously aware of. So I can totally understand that. I mean, it's it, 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 you get more and more desperate to get out and then you feel like you can't. And there's a reason for that. And the getting out really involves getting professional help after that, because it is about breaking this trauma bond, I, I, you know, in the beginning. And, and that can take time. And then it's about getting to other pieces of work and in healing and recovering. <clears throat> well, fear, obligation and guilt. Yes. Which often comes from childhood, by the way, too. Alchemic truth. I experienced that too, Mikhail, but I felt, I bet feeling trapped is common. Yes, especially if you live with them. It's hard to leave. Absolutely. And what I'm acknowledging here and what what you are saying, both of you, is that, you know, there's another narrative out there that suggests that you get trapped by the borderline. And that's not the case, but you get trapped in the dynamic, trapped in the trauma bond, and trapped by what you're going to learn more about yourself and what you need to heal. So definitely. But they don't have the power to trap you. But they're part of the dynamic, you know, so there's that. Um, Lou, absolutely arrested development. I can clearly see the emotional three-year-old acting out behind the intelligent adult. Yeah, well said. Maria, um... Well, and people can feel trapped because of children, definitely. And then those are hard decisions to make, you know, depending whether you're the mother or especially for men as the fathers of BPD or NPD mothers. It's like, um, man, we need to wake up the courts in a big way because no untreated custody B woman should ever have custody of her children. That's my stance. And, uh I guess it's a natural stance I would take because I was the child of two of these crazies and it, it doesn't go well for children. Um, and then, you know, some people have to weigh, you know, cause I've had many clients, male clients that have stayed and, and some just getting close to their child being 18, can't wait to get out. And then it just depends on whether it's constant fighting or not and what's really best for the child and, or, not every man can make that kind of sacrifice. Like, you know, because if you didn't know what was going on and and now you just find out they have BPD and a baby's on the way or you have a one-year-old, you know, it, it's sort of like how to create a healthy environment or at least half a one to counter the other one versus staying together. Those are things a lot of people go through um, hellish choices uh, with. 
Yeah, I like that, Shadow Moses. The cost of staying is you. But sometimes, uh, I think a lot of my clients that have stayed or just hanging in there, to, you know, like she's just sort of like fingernails on the ledge, so to speak, is that because everything's sort of, see, not everybody with BP is going to do as much devaluing in, in an obvious way. And some of them get through years of marriage first. Not that it's not rocky, but people, you know, it's not as rocky as it could be. And so it's it's more people that have children that are getting close to becoming of age. But by that point also, um, those kids are not old enough to be able to handle and have it explained to them. So, you know, it's a question of whether staying for the child makes it better or worse. Because either way, the child is going to absorb some some damage, right? But, they, you know, children have resiliency and... If they're put in counseling, even at young ages, or play therapy if it's younger, it can really make differences. I wish that was around when I was a kid, but then they wouldn't have sought it out. Um, and Minish, my person with BP has been working on themselves, and I've noticed solid change. But now it almost seems like they're overconfident in themselves, right? And well, and that that might just be... You know, they're, they're, they're making some change great, but the overconfidence is a red flag because they shouldn't be overconfident yet or overconfident ever because confidence, one thing, overconfidence still, overcompensatory, hiding something, and um, they may not know what it is. And then you also have to keep assessing whether or not there's been too much damage done in the relationship for it to continue even if they continue in therapy. But the overconfidence is a red flag right now because change is one thing. But, I mean, even by the time I was told, and you know, I was told I recovered from BPD and then I had to go on and learn what life was going to be like like that. I mean, I still probably had not enough confidence yet at that point. Not, not was I overconfident. So be wary of that. Um Yeah, that's a good point, though, um, to what Minish, uh, Minish just said, yes. Albert, do people with BPD have long-term commitment issues in relationships and jobs? Yes. I mean, some are more high-function. They can stay committed to a job, perhaps. But relationships, uh, they really don't commit to them unless they've had a lot and, and significant treatment. Again, because they're not really attaching, you know, um, so commitment issues are huge and they're usually huge for a lot of people with BPD with jobs and relationships and from the more high functioning with BPD which doesn't mean they're less BPD they might make a commitment and do a job well but th their interpersonal relationships even on the job aren't that great and interpersonally with a significant other uh, no it's still going to be horrible uh, Jonathan M., I hope that someday soon all of us can wake up alone and content or in a healthy relationship. And that when we think of the ex-BPD, we can wish them well without any stress. Day still seems far away. Well, you know, you stay in your journey of healing and you, you, you stay with that path and people get there. You know, and each person in their own time. <laughs> Deborah, I don't know what that means. Balance in the force. Anakin Skywalker must be BPD. Doesn't matter. Um, there was a time in the 90s where psychiatrists were coming out, diagnosing, um, I don't know, was, I don't know my Star Wars too well. Um, Darth Vader. They diagnosed him with BPD. Wouldn't that be more like psychopathy? Just saying. Um, and I thought, look at psychiatrists. They have all day to play around diagnosing characters in movies. Great. Uh, they can't even diagnose the people in the front of them in their offices. But yeah. Um, you know, to what you said there, Steffi, to what Jonathan M. said, it's, or Murphy, yes. It's, it's really um, interesting, too, because, because that is something that I keep forgetting to you know, say something about here, which is 
when you said that that is, you like that vision, well, what people can also do in a healing and recovery process when you're not there to, to wherever you're there is yet, is create a vision board and really, you know, as much as you need to work on what you, you might need to work on now, but create a vision board of what you want the future to be like or when, when you know, however far away or, or that is or isn't for each individual. Yeah, create a vision board and, 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 and then envision in moments that solitude, that peace, that everything that Jonathan described there. Um, That's yeah, funny, Shadow Moses, but I wouldn't go with that in a literal sense. Uh, but it has something, you know, it says something for sure. Um, yeah, wow. So, just, um, I don't know which movie best portrays BPD because... It's not fatal attraction because that's really the portrayal of a psychopathic woman, um, which, you know, for years everybody thought it was a betrayal of a borderline woman. Um, and let's not forget that a lot of guys have BPD and they're no sweethearts to be around either. Um, so, no, Girl Interrupted, I don't think was the best portrayal of BPD at all because the character with BPD was so outshined and, and overplayed by Angelina Jolie's character, who was basically, I think, a psychopath, if I remember correctly. Um, well, Fatal Attraction isn't, isn't portraying a borderline. There's been more um, analysis of that recently. Um, Mikhail, um, I quit drinking seven years ago. Good for you. I'm treating this as an addiction, too. Well, it is. And there are parallels, so you're on the right track with that, Mikhail. Obviously, any contact whatsoever is a relapse. Yes, that, that's a good way to put it. And with reference to the fact that you were able to quit drinking, so, you know, you're not going to be feeling addicted to her forever either, you know, but things take time. Hey there, Rob. Blue Valentine had some moments that portrayed BPD. I'm not, I don't even know what that is. So I'm not a good person to ask about movies because I don't watch them all willy-nilly for the sake of it. i not that interested in a lot of different movies. Um... Well, Girl Interrupted was, I don't remember much about it now, but it wasn't, it was the greatest title ever, but the Angelina Jolie character got kind of overshadowed and I think messed up what they were trying to say about her struggle, the other character's struggle with BPD. And uh, I find that woman that was, you know, the character of Girl Interrupted with BPD, find her story very lacking in detail of her recovery. Don't doubt she could be recovered, but... Um, so, Girl Interrupted, like I, like I said, best title on Earth uh, to describe it, I think. But um, then it went a little, like, you know, might have been moments in there. It's been a long time since I've seen it. Uh, compared to other things that people think is BPD, it might be one of the better depictions. I don't know. Shadow Moses, there's this TV series called My Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, which tells the story of a BPD woman. Oh, I didn't know about that. Is that on, um, well, if it's on TV, why would I know? I don't watch TV. Um, is that available anywhere online, or is that just TV? Oh, in a satire fashion. Hmm. Well, in a satire fashion, might be still, you know, worth people watching. I mean, it's up to people if they want to watch it or not. But um, probably satire, well, for some people it might be good. And for some other people it might not be so helpful. I don't know. Um, but I'm not a big movie watcher. I mean, I never was into science fiction, fantasy, whatever you call it now. Because it's abject programming is what it is. But... Um, so I never found the entertainment value in that, but Trev, I think eyes give away um, a BPD. What are your thoughts? Um, I think they can if you are starting to realize at the same time, if you're starting to realize what's going on. But in the beginning, um, 
I don't think that eyes give away a BPD nearly as much as eyes can give away a narcissist. But that's not to say that that isn't possible. Because it depends what people see in, in someone's eyes. Um, Rob, movies can definitely brainwash people. Every time someone mentioned BPD, they always said, yeah, quote, bunny boiler, unquote. And and that's what a psychopathic woman would be into. Um, well, if you want to watch some diagnosed famous people or infamous people and movie characters all day, check out the guy that vomits a DSM. Oh, yeah, him. Into a camera in a monotone voice. Yes, well, he talks in circles that go nowhere. Um, but he doesn't really inform people of anything they probably already hadn't heard of. He just talks in a circle and goes, I'm not diagnosing them. Why doesn't he just step out and actually say something unique or different? Because he's too much of a freaking automaton. And then, are people supposed to take him... Oh, never mind, can't take him seriously anyway, because he is like an automaton of the DSM, which people really got to get their heads out of that crap, because it is a lot of crap. So, just saying. Um, Well, yeah, maybe, but it but it isn't, yeah. It's somebody with, well, I would say Bacton and this other guy have about, yeah, they, bo they both seem like a ton of a ton, so I wonder what that means for the other one. I don't know. All I know is I can't watch, I watched a couple of those videos, and I'm telling you, they're just circles. They go nowhere, they say nothing important, there's nothing added, it's just circle. And done. But people love him. So, more power to the guy. He's probably increased his channel subscriptions, but I don't know how much doing that. Uh, Wheels, quote, I'm not diagnosing them, but that seems borderline, end quote. Yeah, that guy. I know. Uh, I just think when he started doing that, he pooped all over his head. So, many people might not notice that. But how do you keep credibility and you're doing that, which is just circular sensationalism, uh, clickbait, to put it straight up. Um, oh, thank you for that, Trev. I, I just do things the way I do them. I understand the way I understand them. And frankly, I'm an expert from the inside out. That's all I have to say. Other than that, whatever other people say, I don't know what they say, some of the stuff they say, but they do say it. Of course, some of it is the misleading pseudoscience of psychiatry, too, because they can't prove anything about what they're saying, but they're they are also putting a lot of confusion out there. So I guess people pick up on various different pieces of that. But I just would like to say, too, um, again, I think it's important that people with BPD, the understanding of BPD online is not that great. Um, and, and what that means is people don't understand just how much is encompassed, how much behavior, how much of everything is encompassed within BPD before you even start thinking they're this, that, and the other thing, which I think is important for people to maybe learn more about. And I try to talk about it here. and Maybe I'll be, you know, I haven't got to doing more work at AJMahari.co. I want to. Maybe I'll put up more of that information over there where I can at least blog about it in peace and not have to get comments on it. Not, not that I don't love most, you know, all your comments and everything. Please feel free to comment. I'm talking about the kind of comments that you won't ever see on my channel because I'm not going to engage it. But you know what? I'm not that much, I'm not into censoring because if it's not abuse or ridiculous, it, it just goes through. And, and I learned something. Well, I mean, I've always known this, but I've learned even more lately. Ah. Never mind what they say. You know, some people that are forwarding things that I think aren't helpful, well, they have the right to do that, too. And I don't... So, basically, I just don't reply to them anymore. Um, and the other thing, too, I've noticed, not to criticize, you know, because most commenters would... But people often, and sometimes people just have to tell the story. I get that. But they often don't say anything about what I said in the video or 
What I find kind of amazing, and maybe people don't listen to the whole thing, I get that, but is that they will say something and then in their comment or sharing or kind of just unloading as people do and comment sometimes, they'll ask a question that I actually answered in the video. It's like, okay. So just saying, that's just what I see sometimes. Not not judging. Um, Shadow Moses, AJ, the little snippet here on YouTube is Rebecca asked Dr. Okay, however you say that. For a new diagnosis from... Yeah, to those interested, TV series about BPD can link here. I'm not sure I followed that, but okay. Um, Trev, what advice um, would you give to BPD haters? Um, it's understandable somebody hates somebody who hurt them with BPD, but to be investing your energy in hating all people with BPD when they didn't hurt you and you haven't even met them and they're not all the same, um, I think people have to, you know, people have to heal themselves first, but then people have to realize that these people, uh, don't do half as much on purpose as people think they do. doesn't really excuse it at all, but the reality of a narcissist targeting versus a borderline just, you know, lost in their trauma, but it's not an excuse for abuse. So I think what I would say to BP haters is, First of all, they're not all the same, and people really need to get off planet they're all the same just because, well, yeah, that happened to me too, that happened to me too. Well, there's going to be that because of certain patterns, but they're not all the same with those patterns. So I think the best advice is really that people are giving too much power to people with BPD and narcissists. People are giving too much of their own self and power away. Uh, lost themselves more to these people and the abuse. And the thing is, you really got to focus on yourself. So that's my advice to BPD haters is the more you hate, the more you're stuck, the more you're blocking your own healing and recovery journey. And so any focus on them, hating them. So I have clients who hate them in the beginning and however people feel is how they feel. But be careful where you're putting your energy because you need it the most and you deserve it the most. Um, Dimebag, what's the difference between BPD and triggered CPTSD? Well, three hours and six minutes into a live stream, I really, that would take a long time. Um, and ostensibly, I think the answer to the profession of mental health is depends who you ask on any given day because I don't think we know. And of course, the pseudoscience of psychiatry won't even recognize CPTSD. So one thing I can say on that rather quickly is that um, there is a difference and yet they're probably the same thing, but with a difference, one delineated difference. And because CPTSD begins in childhood, full stop, as said by P. Walker, no exceptions, no caveats, then I don't understand the narrative out there that, oh, after you're abused by the borderline or the narcissist, you're going to, quote, develop, unquote, CPTSD. So that's the best I can do with it right now because I can't really sit here and parse the differences. There's a lot of similarities, I can say that. But I'm not somebody who's going to say they're exactly the same. I think there's still one important delineation. But what's coming around the world is a more understanding that BPD is closer for most more people than not with it to CPTSD, but it does begin in childhood. So, um, oh yeah, Wheels, you put up the video. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking about there, but okay. Uh, you're very welcome, Deborah. Take care. And um, yeah, I got to get going too because, well, it's not too late, but the length of these. I don't know how people get through them or, but this one was pretty much on topic and hopefully it will be helpful to people. Um, that's what it's all about. And more to the point though, people that are on the stream and people that share with each other, like you, you guys did tonight, supporting each other, sharing, etc. I think that that's the real benefit of the live stream besides whatever I can say. Sometimes it might help, but people supporting each other and being in the experience is probably the, the number one benefit, I guess. Um, pain cave. Why are BPDs unable to answer basic yes or no questions? Example, reconciliation or divorce. Um, 
Yeah, I know, Jonathan. I, I'm I'm like the Energizer Bunny, really. Um, but uh, and you're welcome. Um, Pain Cave. Let me see. Uh, well, they don't have the emotional intelligence or the knowledge of self or the self from which to know what they really want. Um, fear of abandonment plus fear of engulfment. The approach avoidance conflict is in that reality too, especially to that question. But they don't know how to communicate. It goes back to that lost self, lack of self. And so they can't answer yes or no to basic questions because they don't know how they feel or they don't know how to answer because they are that lost. Um, Mikhail, thanks for the slide stream. Really helpful to hear from and share with others in the same situation. Yes. And so I hope people will find it helpful to at least listen to or back to it in parts and pieces or however people watch these when they're longer. Um, Trev, do you know when you'll be doing another live chat? I found your advice very helpful. Well, I'm glad. Um, what's today? Uh, oh, yes. Now it's early Friday. Um, it depends, but likely there'll be one on Saturday or Sunday is best I can do right now because I don't always know. So um, you're very welcome, Shadow Moses. Uh, and everyone take care. And I think it's really great when people can share with each other. And, you know, I don't do the live stream kind of thing where you have to ask me a question or what you say doesn't matter. Because what you say matters a lot, not only to you, but to me and to other people in the stream. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, and if people would, you know, hit the thumbs up on the way out, I'd be super appreciative appreciative of that everybody take care and until next time and maybe there'll be a video in between you never know i don't know right now take care thank you for coming and thank you for sharing